Gluten Morgan everyone, welcome to the 2023 Gluten Morgan's Rica. So first of all, I want to thank you all because it has been a wonderful year. We are more than 100,000 followers. And this year I've been traveling quite a lot. So I started this year in Brazil. As usual, when I travel, I always start a new sourdough starter. But this time I did it using tropical fruit. There goes an effect. And then I went south to Punta del Este, Uruguay, where I baked pizza on the beach. Next, I went back to Spain, to Madrid and Barcelona, where I did a lot of press, TV and radio. Then I did a burger masterclass at the Gluten Morgan's Lab Barcelona. And then I took a flight straight to Paris to record a new video looking for the best baguette at the best croissant. And there I also visited the well-known bakery Poilin. And I also recorded one podcast with Apolonia. And after that, I went back south to Uruguay, Montevideo, and did some workshops with my friend Mary Bernardi. And from Montevideo, I took a flight to Santiago de Chile, where I also gave some workshops with my other friend, Nico Hacedor de Pan. And because I thought I haven't traveled that much this year, I decided to go to Miami to record some pizza videos with my new oven, the Gosney Dome. And after that, since I was almost there, I went to New York to record a video with the burger guru, George Motz. And also a pizza video with my friend, Dan Richer. And I also had time to visit some beautiful bakeries around town. And then I went back south one more time till the end of the world, Ushuaia. There I took some water from the glaciers to refresh my sourdough starter that I had already done there in that city. And I also did two workshops, one at a ski facility and the other one in a hotel. And then straight from Ushuaia I went to Belgium, to Saint-Vit, where the sourdough library is located. Then I met my friend Carl and gave him this sourdough starter from Ushuaia. It is number 146. And finally, I returned to Santiago de Chile and did a few more workshops there. So it's been quite a travel around the world year and I want to thank you and do a toast with you. So, chin chin to all, happy 2024 and here comes the recap. Eh? Is this champagne? So you want to know which is the best flour for baking bread? Stay watching this video and I'll show you with four different ones. So now we are ready to start the experiment of today. And these are the only ingredients that we have. And here you have the formula. Okay, so the first flour to go in is the all-purpose flour, the flour meant for pastry. There it goes. Now we go with the sourdough starter. And remember that it should be always ridiculously but ridiculously active. Now let's go with the salt. And finally, the water. Okay, it's been 11 minutes and it's looking kind of good. Okay, I wet my hands and let's check that membrane. Okay, let's put it into this new bowl. Okay, covered and I'll leave it here doing bulk fermentation for around four hours. Maybe I'll make some stretch and folding in the middle and when the dough doubles in size, we'll shape it. Let's continue with the second flour bread flour. And of course, we'll be checking the same thing, time and gluten development. Okay, eight minutes and a half, and I think we have it. Let's put it in the bowl too. Okay, dough two ready. I'll leave it here on the counter, bulk fermenting, maybe some stretch and folding, till it doubles in size, and then I'll be ready to shape it. Let's move on. And now we're ready to start the third dough of the video, the strong wheat flour. According to my theories, this dough should be done faster than the other ones, because this one has more protein.
Wow, check out those bubbles. Uh, that's all. I'm amazed by the speed of this gluten development. <laughs> okay, let's check this. I can't believe the time that it took to develop this gluten network. Wow! It's almost translucent and it did it really, really fast. This flower is really good. Let's put it in the bowl too. Okay, dough number three ready. I'll leave it here, back fermenting around three, four hours. Maybe some stretch and folding, doubles in size, and then I shape it. And finally, we have arrived to the fourth flower of the day, the whole wheat flour. So as I said, I have no idea of how this flour is going to turn out. four minutes and I need to check this. What? <laughs> what is this? Please, let's check this gluten network immediately. I've never seen this. Take a look at this. And this is a whole wheat flour. Why? Nobody told me about this flour, that I had these grains here at the lab. This is an incredibility. Does this word really exist? Okay, let's put it in the bowl. Good, now time for bulk fermenting, maybe and stretch and fall, I'm not sure because it's really, really tense. And I'll let it ferment for around four hours, maybe, I don't know, this one is faster. Okay, as soon as it doubles in size, we'll shape it. So that's all for today, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Please do this test with your own flowers and see what happens. Nothing, leave me some comments and I'll see you on the next video. You always wanted to know which is the right temperature for baking sourdough bread. Here I have four loaves baked at four different temperatures. Stay watching this video. This side with the one at room temperature and this one baked at maximum temperature. The first thing that we see are the colors, they are totally different. So on my left side I have this pale one which maybe needed five more minutes and on my right side we have this dark one which maybe those five minutes exceeded a little bit more but this is one of my favorites. Here we have the one which is a little bit more flat, it's not flat at all but it's a little bit more flatter and the size goes increasing one by one as we heat it up the oven till we get this last one which is the larger one and darker one. And here's the second loaf, baked at 356 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, let's go with the third one at 428 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm really loving this bread. I don't want to slice it up. Now, the last bread of the day. One of my favorites. I think so. So, we've seen the four loaves baked at four different temperatures. The first thing that we saw is the color. The color, they are really different from the first one with the oven just turned on and with the last one with a very high oven. Then what we also saw is the volume. It went growing in size from the first one to the last one. In my opinion, the best loaves were the third and the fourth one. The first one, I think we just need five or maybe 10 more minutes, but starting on the second and then the third and the fourth, are the best. Then it depends on you. What kind of bread do you like the most? What kind of crust 
do you like? Maybe darker, maybe a little bit more lighter, and also the taste. Maybe you want it more creamy or maybe a little bit more nutty. So now it's up to you. Try with your own oven and see which is the perfect temperature for you. Do you like more regular crumb or more irregular crumb? Stay watching this video and I'll show you how to do it. Here is the formula. Now let's continue with the full air loaf. So here we have the four loaves already shaped. Four loaves? You told us that there were only two loaves. Mm. Yes, four loaves, because I want to take this video to another level. I will make just a little trick. I will keep these two, one degasified and one with all the air, here outside, and I'll take this one first into the fridge for cold fermentation now, immediately. And I'll hold these two here outside on the counter for around an hour. And then, of course, I'll take them two to the fridge. Here we have this mashed loaf, which went earlier into the fridge. Here we have the normal one, which was cold retarded earlier. The also the smash one, who went a little bit more later into the cold weather. And here is the cold retarded normal bread, but went a few minutes later. Here we have the first volunteer, the one which was already flattened, smashed, and taken all its air out, and also went to the fridge for cold fermentation earlier than the others. It looks good, beautiful here. It's light and hollow. Let's check that crumb. Okay. Here I have the one which was not smashed. This one kept all its gases. Almost looks like the other ones. I don't see too much difference. Nice volume, nice ear, light, hollow. Let's open it up. The second flattened, smashed and taken all its air out of it's crumb, also retarded, a little bit more than the other one, the first one. Now, it's also light, hollow, beautiful ear. Let's check that crumb. Okay, last loaf of the video, the one which is normal, it has not been flattened and it went to the fridge a little bit more later. So, I need to open this thing and see what's inside. This is a degas loaf which went earlier into the fridge. Here we have the gasified, the normal one, which went earlier into the cold fermentation. This one is the degas too, but this one went around 40 minutes later to the fridge. The one, the normal one, non-degasified, which went 50 minutes later. To the fridge. The crumb is totally different. These two ones, the one who went a little bit earlier and the one who retarded a little bit more outside the fridge, they both have this regular crumb which is good, of course, it's excellent for toast. And on the right side we see the ones with a more irregular crumb with a little bit more bigger pockets. And there is a slight difference between these two, is that this one is a little bit over fermented, which gives us a loaf with a lower volume and also a more regular crumb, although it is 
not regular but but this one has little bit bigger pockets of course there are many other factors that affect the cram today i just wanted to show you one or, or two to flatten or not to flatten the bread and also retard a little bit more or a little bit longer that was the idea of this test and is it in front of your eyes now you decide which kind of cram you like the most guten morgen everyone i'm here at paris in front of Poland boulangerie and let's see if i can find a polonia Poulain to give us a personal tour inside. This bakehouse has been going on um, at least since the French Revolution, oh. so 1789. Yeah. We've been here for a little over 90 years, mm -hmm. and what's interesting is to see how this place, because it's been time proven, mm -hmm. all of the different methodologies we use, the walls are patined, is a reflection of that. Mm -hmm. And the intelligence of appreciating the work of time the, mm -hmm. and appreciating what time teaches us on how mm -hmm. to do things. So I'll walk you through the different steps of baking bread yes, and yes. Hidden in here is our pétrin, so our pétrin. mixing bowl. It's, ah, a, it's a mixer. Yep, yeah, it's our big mi mixing bowl, like no a mixer. big KitchenAid bowl on steroids. Yeah. We add our three other ingredients, ah. wheat flour through uh -huh. here, sea salt from Guérande mm -hmm. and water mm -hmm. through the tap. Which kind of flour do you use? It's, so, it's whole wheat? So this is mm -hmm. wheat flour. Wheat flour. That is stone ground. A stone ground. And in France we use... Uh, the tea, I know you have the yeah, tea. Yeah, we use the, the taux de cendre mm -hmm. um, and we use a type 80. 80, that's... So that means oh. if, you, if, you, mm -hmm. if you burn a, a kilo of mm -hmm. flour, mm -hmm. then you'll get about 80 grams of ashes. The first thing I should say is that this is a hundred ton heavy, mm. wood-fired brick oven. We heat up the oven, so we gorge it with heat. Mm -hmm. These bricks like soak up the heat, and then when it's not heated anymore, it releases the heat. Yeah. And by releasing the heat, it bakes whatever's inside of the oven. Mm -hmm. So this is where we're gonna come into the Okay, and at which temperature do you well, start? Over 250. Over 250. Uh, over 250. Celsius, of course. So the way this oven works is that we will heat it up, Mm -hmm. Bring it to the temperature, Then put everything we want to bake in. Uh -huh. You don't let it cool down a little bit? Well, ah. five, ten minutes. It depends on how the oven is. Okay, yeah, the temperature. But and what kind of wood do you use? So, we use dry wood. So, more ecological. Yes, mm -hmm. and because it's fully dry in small pieces, it mm -hmm. burns entirely. So, there's very little leftovers mm. and the combustion is complete. Ah. So, this is a bowl in which we normally put water, water. inside. So For steam. Exactly. So, when we're heating up the oven, yes. we remove that bowl uh, ah. that's empty. Uh -huh. And and you can you can feel the heat, right? Yes. Like, uh, it's, it's nice and warm. And so, in this mm. thing, you see this cast iron mouth uh -huh. that helps direct the flame into the oven. Ah. So we put it in place of the things. It helps direct the flame into the oven. Mm -hmm. And once the flames is out because the wood mm -hmm. is burnt, then we start baking whatever it is. We close this up. We put water into the water bowl. We mm -hmm. have the steam and we can start baking the bread inside. Mm -hmm. These peels, the mm -hmm. ones that you see upstairs. So once we've let the dough rise here, so you have a little razor blade on which you the lamb. the lamb on which we score our signature mm -hmm. pea mm -hmm. and then and we bring it in all right ready to grab the bread wow how fast did you oh, see that incredible <laughs> uh, wow is it not a little hot oh yeah so ah. maybe we do a first quick stop in this room so we're in the heart of saint germain des prés mm -hmm. in the left bank of paris and in this shop my grandfather, yes. in 1932, started here. Almost 100 years ago. Almost 100 years ago, yes. exactly. And I heard that he used to sit over there, Exactly, right? he used to mm. sit right behind me. Mm -hmm. And from there, he used to be able to see everything happening in the store. Some tricks he had. Some tricks he had before CCTV, so it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you were talking to me about the chandelier. So and I heard something about Dali. Exactly. We have a lot of people from Spain from watching Spain. this videos. Salvador Dali, in mm -hmm. the 70s, in Paris, was living at L'Hôtel Maurice. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to surprise Gala, mm -hmm. his partner, by creating a whole bedroom made out of Yes, bread. I heard of that. And he had met my father a couple of years earlier oh. and had asked him to do different objects made out of bread. And he did this. And the whole, the whole bread. There was, there was a bed, 
A wardrobe. There was a bed, there was a cabinet, there was a chandelier, there was <laughs> a bedside. I mean, everything. A lamp. Is, a lamp. So this chandelier is made out of dough bread or dough. bread. Exactly. Bread dough. It's bread and dough. And every time we put a new chandelier in place. Yes. How, how long often? does it so last? So this one we just put in place and the previous one had last three years. This bread dough reacts to changes in the temperature. So if it's hot and humid and then dry and cold, ah. it's these differences that make the dough work and that degrade it. And how do you I find out? I have a piece that I've had in... Because something falls? No, <laughs> no, 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 I think no, it's no. time to change. We wait before that, we wait before that. <laughs> Gluta Morgan everyone and welcome to another baking video. We've been our whole life knitting, proofing, and baking bread on the same day. But since this new era of sourdough bakeries and even home bakeries, which I am one, two, there's this idea of proofing, retarding the fermentation, making cold fermentation maybe for hours or even days. And I know that that's good. It makes the bread more tasty, more interesting, but does it apply to all kind of bread? But I'll be doing a whole grain experiment. We'll be working with 100% whole grain flour. So you may know or not, when you work with whole wheat flours, they ferment really faster, faster than a regular one like a white flour. So I will make one dough, then divide it and make two equal loaves. The first one I will proof it and bake it on the same day, and then the other one I will retard its fermentation till the next day and then bake it. Let's go with the dough. In a bowl we'll place a whole wheat flour, spelt flour, ripe flour, the active sourdough starter, and water. We start to mix everything, but pay attention, here we are not going to knead. We simply have to moisten the flour mix, and as you can see, there is no gluten development yet. Now we cover it and leave it here on the counter. An hour later, we wet our hands and you'll see the magic of the gluten in front of your eyes, or instead, in your hands. Here you're seeing the dough completely kneaded. Now we have to add the last ingredient, which is the salt. With a few droplets of water, we are going to dissolve it and begin to integrate it into the dough. It's time to let it rest at room temperature for around an hour. Now it's time to stretch and fold the dough. This way we will allow the gluten network to develop even further. Then we let the dough rest again for half an hour and then here we go again. A few hours later, we'll get this. Wow! Here, having both of them, we can easily realize which one is the winner. On one hand, we have the loaf that fermented for about 6 hours at room temperature. And on the other side, we have the loaf that co-fermented for around 24 hours. What I liked is that both loaves feel very light. That is the crucial thing. <laughs> the other is more an aesthetic issue. But let's cut them and see what they look like inside. And the truth is that the crumb looks airy, uniform, with beautiful bubbles and a very good volume. And we'll save it for the end of the video. Now it's time to cut the cold fermented bread. And it doesn't look so bad. Although it looks a little bit flat, it has very nice bubbles. The crumb is even and feels super lightweight. Let's also cut a slice. And here you can see both in detail. The one we did at room temperature and the one that spent 24 hours in the fridge. The crumbs really don't feel that different. What is noticeable is the size of the slice. The bread we fermented at room temperature has more volume. And the other, the cold one, was a little flatter and kind of stretched sideways. The difference in taste is very subtle, perhaps a little more acidic as a result of being 24 hours in the cold. Would you like to know which is the secret ingredient that will make you bake from this bread till this one with the same wick flour. Stay watching this video. So here I have not one, instead four different autolyses. In this first one, I did not add any gluten at all. In the second one, we have eight grams of gluten. Then I move to 10 grams of gluten and finally 12 grams of gluten. What I'm looking for in this autolyse is to check the gluten membrane and see how much I can stretch it tears apart. Okay, with wet hands I'll start stretching this dough. It's looking good, but stretching. Interesting. It didn't last it as much as I thought. Okay, it has no gluten at all. Oh, what a mess. Let's go with the 8%. Okay, with my wet hands, 
And here I go again. Oh, it feels totally different. It's not as sticky as the first one. And check this gluten membrane. Wow, incredible. Really translucent and, wow, kind of big. Here I can feel the magic. Okay, good job. Let's move on to the next one, 10%. One more time, wet my hands and I pick up the dough. Oh, this one is heavy. Stretching a little more, oh, it feels tense. Oh, check this membrane, super translucent and I'm feeling stronger than the last one. Good, oh, oh okay, that was really good. And now time of the 12% added gluten. Okay, I wet my hands for the last time and let's start stretching this dough. It feels kinda like the other one, yeah, okay. Start stretching, some resistance. I don't feel too much difference between this one and the last one. But it's looking good, okay. Translucent. Good, well, that's enough. And here are the loaves. So this one is the one with no added gluten. Here's the one with eight grams of added gluten. This is the one with 10 grams. And finally, this one with 12 grams. Time to check the first loaf, the one with no added gluten. At first sight, I'm liking it, it's light, it's hollow, the caramelization of the crust is excellent. That's here, yes. The shape, well, it could be a little bit more larger, more taller too, but it's okay. We're using a very weak flour. Okay, so let's slice it and see how it's a crumb. Good, beautiful crumb. Think that this is an all-purpose flour, mainly thought to be using pastry. And look at this open crumb that we have here. It's moist, with big pockets too, and it's high hydration. It means that this flour is not that bad. So let's see what happens when we start adding gluten. Now we move to the second loaf, the one with eight grams of added gluten. It's totally different as the first one. Now, this is almost like a ball, it's huge, it's much more higher, and it's also super light, hollow, the crust is beautiful. Let's open it up and check the crumb. What? This crumb is amazing. This is what I've been looking for. Check these big air pockets in here. Totally different as the first one. So take a look at this shape. It's a round shape with a thin crust and crispy and the crumb is very moist. I'm loving this kind of bread, so eight grams of gluten seems to be correct. Third bread, the one with 10 grams of added gluten. The shape is interesting. It's almost like a turtle, but it's super light at the same time. It's crispy. Wow, sounds okay, but what's inside? Why don't we open it? So what an interesting crumb too. Maybe not as much with those big air pockets as the second one, but it looks great. It's really soft, humid and tender. Maybe because the gluten network was so strong, it couldn't open and get those big air pockets that we're looking for. Maybe this was too much tension. Or maybe we could have left it more time doing cold fermentation. That helped this gluten network to lose a little bit, but it's okay, this bread too. And the fourth loaf of the day is really, really light. And I don't know what kind of shape it has. But I'm loving it, the crust is beautiful, super light as I said, and I want to know what is inside of this loaf. Let's open it. Mm. 
Nice scrum too, maybe not that open as the third one or the second one. Maybe this too much gluten strength has tightened the cramp and didn't let it grow as it could and develop all those big holes that I like. But it's tender, it's humid, it's okay, but I think 12 grams of gluten was too much. I seen first on the flour test, then when we start kneading, and finally when we shape the bread. So this is the result, it was okay, this is an experiment. So now we've reached the end of the video and here in front of your eyes you can see the whole experiment. The first bread with no added gluten, 8 grams of gluten, 10 grams of gluten and 12 grams of gluten. In my opinion I think that the winner is this one, the one with 8 grams of gluten. We move from 9% to 14% which is an interesting strong wheat flour. These two ones here Maybe that was too much strength, so what I recommend, and maybe in another video I'll be doing that, is to let them more time in the fridge doing cold fermentation. Are you always dealing with sticky doughs? Stay watching this video and I'll show you a few tricks so you don't have to fight anymore with this. Here is the formula. Now, let's continue with the sourdough starter. Remember that it always needs to be very, very active. Salt. Last ingredient, water. All the ingredients in. Now, time to start mixing. As I told you before, we'll be using the dough hook, which is the perfect tool for kneading this kind of mixers. Let's go. Low speed and we'll let the machine do the work for us. Take a look at this. No gluten development at all. What we should be expecting is that this dough gets to the hook. And no. Look at this. It's like a pancake dough. <laughs> but don't worry, I have a solution. So let's get rid of the hook and say hello to the paddle. Yes, the old paddle of your mixer is going to help you a lot. Now that we're going to use the paddle and let's see what happens. Start. I think I have good news and let's check this dough. I want you to see this. Ha 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 ha. So I am really happy and I hope you too. This is the result that I was looking for. To get this dough hooked or hold to the paddle. That's different when we are dealing with high hydration doughs. Of course, if you're using a lower hydration like 70, 60 or maybe 55%, that will be okay to use the hook, the regular dough hook. But in this case, when the dough is too sticky, when you use the paddle, it's going to be totally different. Of course, remember, it also depends on the flour that we're using. We need to use flour that can hold that amount of water. In this case, it was a lot of water. And let's check what we're looking for, the gluten development. That's the, the key of this experiment. Take a look at the membrane. It should be almost translucent and resist a little bit. Oh, okay, good perfect gluten development. That means that the dough is already kneaded and then we can continue with our bread process, whichever it is. So you want to learn how to bake this loaf here, Julien is going to show you how. Flour, milk, sugar, salt, oil, yeast. No That's butter. No butter in France. No we put the milk in the Which bowl of oil. Very important. The salt is here. Mm -hmm. Yeast is here. Mm. Okay. So you're the Never. one that don't mix salt and, and yeast exactly. kind of guy. You see he's here and here. Okay. First step, we put the yeast inside. You're using fresh yeast. Some foldings to make it more, to give it more strength. Yeah, a little bit. Can I give it the final touch? Who doing that? Ramon, oh, yeah. what is that? Here's the dough. What a night yesterday.
Let's go, 45 minutes. Oof, it smells like butter, but oh there's no butter. It's like biting a cloud. Yeah, it's a cloud. Nothing. Cloud, air, pure air. And take a look at this. It's caramel salt. I tell you, that's my favorite bread. You should definitely bake this bread and sell it at your store. Soon. Soon. <laughs> Would you like to learn how to make the super active sourdough starter from scratch? Stay watching this video. In a jar, we put two spoons of flour. Now we add some water and we start mixing. We're looking for a stiff dough. It doesn't have to be that liquid. If it's too liquid, then we can add some more flour. And if it's too stiff, we can add more water. This is the texture that we're looking for. It's like a mousse. So what is going on now in this project of sourdough starter? Well, what we're doing is fermentation. Yes, we're using the nature to ferment this flour in our own benefit. The key to have a healthy sourdough starter is to feed it. But why are we feeding the sourdough starter? Because it's alive. And feeding with what? With flour. Remember that in the flour are the starches, the sugars. So they will be feeding from these starches and making some CO2, which is gases, and also some waste. And as I said, we need to feed them and then we also need to give them the right temperature. The right temperature should be room temperature, which is around 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's all for today. What we're going to do now is to leave it here at room temperature until tomorrow. Gluten morning everyone and welcome to day two. Let's check how is our sourdough starter project. So as you can see, there is not much activity, which is normal. So what do we have to do now? The same as yesterday. Feed it again with more flour and more water. Just like yesterday, we'll feed it with two spoons of bread flour. Now we add some water, always by the eye, remember that. And with the spoon, we start mixing it. always looking for this kind of texture. It's like a heavy cream. That was all for day number two. As yesterday, we'll leave it again here at room temperature. 77 degrees Fahrenheit is the best temperature. And now I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, I didn't know you were recording. I was having my breakfast. Good morning. So now we are at day three. Let's check how is our project. Hmm, I hope you have seen that. There is a little bubble there. That means that we are going good. We are going okay. There is some kind of fermentation going here. So what do we have to do now? the same as yesterday and the day before, feeding it. Let's go with two spoons of flour. Now a little water by the eye, start mixing and looking for the same texture. If it's too stiff, add some more water. And if it's too hydrated, just add a little bit more flour. It is as simple as that. So that's all for day number three. What do we have to do? Nothing, wait until day four. See you tomorrow again. Welcome to day four of this sourdough starter project. Yes, I know, but I have many black t-shirts. 
So now it's looking much better. There are many, many bubbles going on in that jar. We have a really good looking fermentation going on. So what do we have to do now? So at this point, what I recommend is to discard one third of this mix. This will clean this sourdough starter and then with a new refresh, we'll give it a lot of strength. So now we'll feed it with a little bit more flour. Yes, three spoons this time. And some more water. Remember that we're always doing this by the eye. And in this case, as you can see, I am adding a little bit more water because it was a little bit stiff. Now I have the right texture. Take a look. Perfect. Lid on. So now I don't want to spoil it, but I think that something is going to happen. So finally we have arrived to day number five and what you've seen was the magic of the fermentation. Yes, now we have a perfectly working and really, really active sourdough starter. Do you want to learn how to bake high hydration bread in two different ways? Stay watching this video. Let's check the recipe. So here I have all the ingredients and this time are duplicated because I'll be doing one with my friend the mixer and here on the other side with my friend my hand. Hi Gluten! How are you? Time to start. First, the mixer. In the mixer bowl, we put all the flowers. Now the salt, the sourdough starter, and we start adding the water, leaving some for later. Good, the mixer has started and it'll be adding water very, very slowly. Time to start the handmade dough. In a bowl, we'll put all the flowers. Now we add the salt, the sourdough starter. And we'll start adding the water very, very slowly. With the scraper, I'll start mixing everything I am not kneading just incorporating all the ingredients. What I'm looking for is to wet all the flowers. A little bit more here, a little bit more over here. Okay, that's enough. And that's all. Oof, and the mixer is also ready. <laughs> okay, it's looking good, but before I check the gluten membrane, let me cover this one first. And now time to cover it. So now I leave them here on the counter at room temperature for 30 minutes. And here I have both those already kneaded and with the stretching and foldings done. Now they will start ball fermenting. Ball fermenting means that the dough should rise and double in size. That should take around four hours maybe at room temperature always. On my left side, I have the dough done with the mixer and on the right side, I have a dough done with my own hands. Now that the batars are shaped, it's time to take them into the fridge, which is it around 40, 41 degrees Fahrenheit. So they can do the cold fermentation until tomorrow. See you. We dust the peel with some semolina flour and then we transfer the loaf on it. Now we slash it. 
and very carefully we put it in the bag. Okay, let's go. The oven is preheated at 482 degrees Fahrenheit. And finally, after all this work, here are the two loaves. I know that you have already noticed that this one is a one done with the mixer. And this one is a handmade one. The color, the crust, both are the same. The only change is the volume, because this one had a better gluten development, that's why. But both are light, both are hollow, and both must be delicious. So, why don't we open them up and check the crumb, if there is another difference too. And it's also a good reflection, not what you see from the outside, it's the same as you see on the inside. So you want to learn how to make this rice bread in a blender? Stay watching this video. Here is the formula. And remember that you can download my app, it's totally free for Android or iPhone. Let's start. First of all, we need to soak the rice. So we put the rice in a bowl and then we add water. This water is not the water from the recipe. We just need an extra water and it needs to cover all the rice. Okay, but first of all, we need to strain the rice. This is really easy. We put all the ingredients in the blender. Now we put the lid on and let's start kneading. It's going to take about five minutes. The mix should be really smooth. <laughs> and here I have the mold, which is already oiled. And the measure is 10 inches per four and four inches here too. The mix that I did is one kilo and 300 grams, which is okay for this mold. Then you can adapt it to the molds that you have at home. And we'll bake it for 30 minutes. Time to take it out of the oven. Whoa! Wow! Wow! <laughs> Guten Morgen everyone, I am in Madrid and I'm here at the Horno de Babette to visit my friend Bea, which is going to tell me how to make her famous recipe, the basic bread. Come with me. Okay Bea, let me add your recipe into my app, the Gluten Morgan Baker's Percentage, which is totally free for you to download for iPhone or Android, so then you can do this recipe at home too. So the idea of the simple bread is that anyone at home 
no matter what they have, they don't have to be experts, they haven't had to have made bread before, mm -hmm. they can do it. All that it requires basically is a bowl, bowl. and then a flour, flour. flour <laughs> a, a bit of salt, okay. uh, it's nice, and, and, the, and the yeast, we're not making it with sourdough, okay. with levante. But you can buy this at a supermarket, yeah. and groceries, And okay. really, almost everyone has a bowl at home. And this is a dough that has sort of medium hydration, you can see the, the quantity we're adding, it's 200 and four. It's not the end of the world if it's a few more grams, right? Now I want to see you. So now Ooh. it's two fingers. That's a secret. That's the secret. Mm. This is the secret weapon. And it's clockwise. And it's very important that it's clockwise. Mm. And again, just to keep up with the idea that anyone at home can do it with whatever they have, the normal things one has in the kitchen, a plate is something we all have in the kitchen. Yeah. So we cover it with a plate. So it's been two hours. Two hours? It was really fast. Yes, very <laughs> fast. It could also be three hours. Ah. Yeah. It wouldn't okay. matter. Or it could be an hour and a half. Probably no less than an hour and a half. But that means you can adapt it to your life. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> yes. What happened here? It's grown a lot. It's a bit hot in the bakery. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> Take a look at this. To put the thumbs at the bottom of the bowl, because it's a bit easier to turn it around. So you just turn it around and then let it drop. And then it comes off a few seconds. Wow. Clock. You have 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock. So you take 12 to the center, mm -hmm. and then you see that a little corner appears here. Mm -hmm. And then you, you take that one and you bring it to the center, and then a new corner appears here. So then you take it and you bring it to the center, and then a new corner appears, and then like that, like that, Making like that. Stitches. Yes, mm -hmm. st making stitches. So when you finish, you have uh, a smaller diameter uh -huh. dough. Like anyway, a bowl. It's like a bowl. You could actually just turn it around and round it a bit and put it into a round banneton or whatever. So then we turn it like this. So you don't really need a banneton, you can use just a napkin. And if you just have a napkin, you put it in and then you fold it quite tightly from one side and the other by putting a flower, otherwise it's going to stick. Yeah. Okay, but in this case, we're going to put it in the banneton. So now the beauty of this is that you take your banneton and you put it in the fridge and mm -hmm. then you preheat the oven. And the time the oven is preheating is the time that your dough is going to need in the fridge. At and what temperature? Uh, the oven at 230. And you can even go a little bit lower. Just don't go higher. It doesn't generally work that well at home. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take our bread and okay. we're going to turn it around. Wow. Remember, it comes from the fridge. Yes, right? it's cold and it's huge. Wow, beautiful. Time to bake. Wow, what a beautiful piece of bread. It's, it's still hot. Oh, yeah. ah, ah, ah. Ow. <laughs> okay, let it cool down and then we slice it, right? Yes. Okay, so when you're cutting your bread, it's very, very important that you actually do it with the right technique so you don't cut your finger off. And basically, what you need to do is get the knife trapped into the bread. Then you continue cutting it. Try this. Oh, <laughs> you like? It tastes just like bread. If you want to learn more about pre fermentation, keep watching this video. On one side, we have a natural pre ferment, and on the other side, we have the pre ferments made with commercial yeast. So let's start with the first pre ferment, known as Polish, but we should say better Polish. Let's start the Polish. And here you see the basic Polish formula. So in the bowl, we put the flour. In this case, I'm using white flour, but of course you could use some whole wheat flour. Now we add the water, the same weight as the flour, and now here goes fresh yeast. Remember that you're using dry yeast, it's just one third. We start mixing it with the spoon until everything is well combined. Now I'll cover it and leave it here on the counter for around 8 to 12 hours at room temperature. And then we'll have it ready to bake some bread. This preferment, this sponge, is mostly the same as the polish, only that it uses a little bit less of water. The hydration is around 85% and it uses a little bit more of yeast, which makes this preferment ferment more faster. And here I have for you the classical formula. In a bowl, we put the flour. 
Now we add the water, which is a little bit less than the weight of the flour. And now we add the yeast. Pay attention, now I'm using more yeast than before. Remix it. As you can see, it's a little bit more dense. Now everything is incorporated and we're done. Now we cover it, leave it here on the counter at room temperature till it doubles in size. Okay, let's continue with this preferment trip around the world. Now we are in Italy. Yes, the home of the biga. And as I told you before, all the benefits that the preferments give to our doughs is that the biga will fill your dough with all the aromas and perfumes from Rome. Here's the classic formula. In the container we put the flour. Now we add the water, which is the half of the weight of the flour, and we add the yeast. Now we start mixing it. As you can see, this is a very, very dry dough. It's full of chunks, but it's okay. That's the way that the biga should be done. So we cover it so it doesn't get more dry and we leave it here on the counter for around 18 hours. It depends a little bit on the room temperature. So on the next day, we we'll get this beautiful biga. As you can see, it has not doubled in size, which is okay. And you still see those chunks here, which is also normal. Okay, time to move on to the last preferment of this video, which is the pâté fermenté. So this preferment is the easiest one because it's just some bread dough. And the difference between this one and the other ones that we've seen in the video is that this one is the only one which has salt in it. Why? Because it's just a bread dough. The dough that I'm showing now is just a regular bread dough. But if you want just a good bread recipe, here is one. But remember, you can also try mixing all these preferments in one dough. I've never said that. Gluten Morgan, everyone, let's talk about oven spring. I will do all kind of tests to see what we should or what we shouldn't do to get the best oven spring. Let's get back to basics, which is simply baking some bread. Let's pretend we know nothing about bread making and let's bake this loaf of bread without doing any scoring. Let's just put it in the oven. No artisans. And what's going on here? When we put the bread into the oven without any type of tin, it dried immediately and it created the crust. On the inside, the crumb was totally uncooked, looking for any direction to span. It didn't find any place to burst, so it ended up breaking one of its sides. Let's begin test number two, which will be pretty familiar to the one we did before. But in this case, we're going to score the loaf and see what happens. Why it has no ear. Right now we can see this loaf of bread is halfway through getting where we want it. It is flat and it has no ear. Let's begin the next test. Here's our loaf ready to be baked. Let's place it on top of the peel. This time we're going to bake it with steam. Isn't it amazing when things go as planned? Let's enjoy this loaf, which is pretty sexy. Now let's talk about of one of my favorite making methods, the Dutch oven. And here we're going to place our loaf. And here it is. Now we're going to use another method that is pretty similar to the one we used before. Instead of using a Dutch oven, we're going to use this oven plastic bag golden color. And here it is. Perfect. Important to take into account when you're going to make bread. Wow. Is to check on our sourdough starter activity. It needs to be super active creamy and full of bubbles like the one I'm showing. Oh, bubbles. Another thing we need to take into consideration is the proofing time, which means the right moment when the bread is ready to be baked. Sometimes it could be underproofed. Many other times it could be ready to be baked. Maybe a little bit overproofed. And well, don't even look at this. All right, let's see what happens when we bake a loaf slightly overproof. Oh, I don't want to see it. It was obvious, a flat bread. What happened here is pretty simple. The leavening agents, which fermented for way too long, have eaten all the available sugars. 
That's why, while it was being baked, they didn't have enough to feed from and the loaf didn't grow and remained flat. We may end up using flour that is not as strong as we need it to be and when we mold it, the loaf will end up sliding to the side like a pancake. Well, I guess we shouldn't have done that. Let's keep going with the tests. The tool that we use to score the bread is really important. Achieving a good year depends mostly on it. For example, we could use this beautiful lamb made out of olive wood, or this one, although I don't know what type of wood it's made of. We can also use a metallic lamb like this one, which looks more like a scalpel, or the plastic version, which comes in green, blue, or pink. Have you ever seen this strange liquid on top of your sourdough starter? Ooh. But don't worry, gluten has a solution for you. First, we need to get rid of this liquid, which, as I told you, is ooh, mostly acid. Oof, well, it's not that bad. Let's get rid first of all of this strange liquid and a little bit of the sourdough starter. I tried to discard half of it. Now, in order to bring it back to life, and it depends on how long it has been forgotten, this will take a few hours. So, now we have this cart, and now we have the sourdough starter here. And what we need? The same as always. The same flour that you used to feed it, or if you want, you can use whole meal, pelt, kamut, whatever you have. And, as always, we'll do it by the eye. A few spoons of flour, maybe two. Three, it's okay. Some tap water. We'll mix it and we'll be looking for a texture. I haven't weighed anything, no measures, nothing. Just by the eye. If it's too liquid, then I'll add a little bit more of flour, like I need today. And if it's too stiff, I could add more water. The idea is that we mix it and bring it back to life. Also adding some air into this sourdough starter. And this is a texture that we're looking for. Not that liquid, not that stiff, it's just like a glue, maybe. This is a texture that we need to achieve our goal, to make this ferment again and to, to come back to life. So, what we will do now, I will cover it with this lid and leave it here at room temperature and wait till it comes back to life. So you want to learn how to bake this incredible whole grain bread with carob flour, linen seeds and pistachio. Here's Anna who is going to tell us how to do it. So we're going to start the recipe, mm -hmm. Ramon. It's an organic whole wheat mm -hmm. flour. Good. We always use organic because it's a whole grain which goes there inside, so it's important to be organic. We're going to mix the flour and, and the sourdough, sourdough starter. Dough. Good. Okay. Which is a stiff sourdough starter. Yeah, it's a stiff sourdough starter. Mm -hmm. We have a liquid sourdough and we have a mm -hmm. stiff sourdough. And how many sourdough starters do you have at Baluard? <laughs> is it French Baluard? No, no, it's not French. Put it Cut in small yeah, pieces. Yeah, because we're, going, we're mixing chunks. by hand, which is not very common for me. Or for, for you? No, you don't Because mix. in the bakeries, we always mix with a mixer. Mm. So... Let's go to go back to the basics. We're going to go back to the basics, mm -hmm. exactly. We're going to add now the rest of the flowers. Mm -hmm. This is the algarroba. Flour. The algarroba flour. I don't know the word in English. Here is the, the, the meaning in okay. English. Okay, the salt. Okay, this is okay. sea salt. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> a bit of yeast. A bit of yeast, okay. which is op optional. It's optional. Just a little bit. All to help the sourdough to go to yeah, ferment we, a little we, bit faster. You can put between three, five grams, grams per kilo of flour. Kilo flour okay. Which means uh, 0 0.5 percent or 0 0.2 percent. Mm -hmm. We're going to start the kneading. So how do you feel mixing by hand again? Well, it's, it's different. It's like you do every day at your bakery, right? <laughs> no, we never do it by hand. This is a gluten morgan style. 
Uh, this is your, your style? <laughs> There's no style. That's a little Morgan <laughs> oh style. Oh my god. <laughs> Okay, Done. Okay. Let's bake it. <laughs> now this has to rest. Let's go put it back in the bowl and then we cover it, right? Yeah, we cover it and we're going to leave it here for one hour. See you in 40 minutes. So take a look, Anna. It's been an hour and this dough has doubled in size. Yes. Incredible. We're going to do it just one hour here, mm -hmm. then we're going to divide 20 minutes more. Put it here on the counter. The first fermentation, this one is very important for the, the flavor. We're going to divide. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we do, we take the dot on the, like mm -hmm. the uglier part mm -hmm. in front of you, and we're going to smash a little bit, mm -hmm. okay. You see that they grow up, mm -hmm. they are in a perfect shape. Yes, they're beautiful. They've been the whole night mm -hmm. on the fridge. Mm -hmm. And now what, what we just need is to, to bake them. So, we have here the breads oh. already cooked. Have you seen how nice? Yeah, it's a little bit warm. Oh, yeah. I like that. Well, it's in, they um, are in the moment the... we can cut it. And, oh. Yeah, they are nice. And look how they broke here. And Incredible. Mmm, they smell oh. so good. They smell like bread. Oof, like bread and the seeds. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh. You can feel the cereal. Yes. Yeah, too. So now I think it's time to cut it. To them. slice it, okay. So here you have Anna. Cheers. Cheers. We're gonna nice. smell it. Mmm. <laughs> Oh, it's incredible. I, I like the crust, which is thin and crispy. Mm, it's good, huh? Mm, the flavor. Mm, mm. Ooh, the pistachio. Mm. Mm, it was a little bit toasted, so... Mm. Super good. Mm. And you can fi feel the um, sourdough, too. Mm -hmm. Wow! Do you want to learn how to bake this pizza sfogliata di patate? Stay watching this video and I'll show you how. And here you have the formula, so you can add it into my app, Gluten Morgan Baker's Percentage, which is free for download in iPhone or Android. Okay, let's start. So first ingredient, flour, into the bowl. I know maybe you're asking why am I going to use the paddle instead of the hook? Because this dough is going to use a lot of water. Yes, I'm talking about high hydration. So when you use the paddle, it's much easier to develop the gluten network. Now goes in the yeast. Now we start the mixer and we go slowly adding the water. I'll reserve this little water for later. Now that we have developed some kind of dough, let's go with the salt. Now we move to spit number two. Last drops in. As I told you, using the paddle, now you can see all the gluten development that we have. So look, that is what I was looking for. The dough is holding the paddle. That means that dough is almost ready. But we still need to add the olive oil. Five more minutes and it's done. Good, dough ready. Dough is ready, so I'll leave it resting here for around 15 minutes, always covered. Now that's been an hour and we've done all the stretching and foldings, I recommend to take the dough to slowly rise in the fridge for around 24 hours. I know that maybe it's too much time, but trust me, is it going to be really worth it? 
See you tomorrow. Let me introduce you the pizza ball. And now we put this giant dough ball on the counter too. I know it's a pity to deflate it, but we have to do it so we can eat an excellent Roman pizza. So we start stretching it with our hands and look, <laughs> this could be a pizza by itself, right? But we need to go on. So let's start stretching it a little bit more. And now comes the roller pin from my friend Richard. Thank you, Richard. We start rolling it and stretching and it's getting larger and larger. And now we can continue with our hands. The idea is to make it as thin as possible, but not that, that thin. Look how beautiful is this dough. It's like a shit. Incredible. One more stretch in here. Another one over here. And we're done. And now that it's all stretched, starts the lamination. Now we wet the dough with some olive oil. And here comes the semolina flour. This is essential. We're going to make layers of dough, olive oil and semolina. We go folding it into itself till we get this rectangle. Now that I've stretched the dough, now it's time for the cheese. Today I have some fresh polpetta mozzarella of buffalo milk. Let's go with the potatoes. Trust in me, dough, potato, and cheese are a hit. Mm, I think I have poker. <laughs> and now time for the second topping. And out of the blue, some Parmesan cheese.
time to bake. Today I'll be baking in my deck oven, which is preheated at 572 degrees Fahrenheit. May the gluten be with you. The pizza is ready. Bottom. Oof, it's super crispy. I just can wait. This is the pizza test you've been waiting for. I am going to try all the most common types of flour on the market to make pizza. The challenge is to make the same pizza with the same recipe in the same oven, but only one ingredient is changed, the flour. So first, let's check the formula, which is in Baker's percentage. Remember that you can download my app for free for Android and iPhone. So then let's get started with the flour, salt, yeast, and water. So when you see this is happening, the dough is ready. Now we lower it to the counter and it's time to shape it. I am going to use these individual containers with a drop of oil and we place a ball inside. Now we cover it so it doesn't dry out and with the help of an elastic band we will mark the point where it began. What we're looking to do is that the dough doubles in size. We can do it perfectly at room temperature but I recommend doing a long and cold fermentation. Yes, I know, it's going to take a little bit longer. Okay, at the end we will have all the doughs ready to make these amazing pizzas in the wood oven, which is already preheated. Let's begin with the first flour, which is Neapolitan flour, which would be ideal for making pizza. It looks like a Neapolitan pizza. Let's go with a 9. Now I want to hear that cornicione. I give it a 9. It's toasted a little too much, so I'm going to give it a 7. And now with the scissors. Yes, scissors, so as not to break the cornicione. Let's see how airy it is. Oh, whoa, 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 that is pure air. I think we can all agree to give it a 10, right? This slice looks quite firm. Uh, let's go with a 9. Okay, now, as usual, the best part. È molto buono. Now we continue with Italian double zero flour, a flour that was perhaps designed to make focaccia. I realize that it has a slightly lower rose. Let's go with an 8. Not bad. I give it an 8. But beware of the base. I give it a 10. Time to cut that cornicione and see how airy it is. But the truth is that it looks very good. Let's give it a 9. And beware, look how it hangs. It deserves another 9. Okay, time to taste it. Mm. Manitoba flour, the classic Italian high gluten flour. And to the Italians, it doesn't need to be really round. But I give it a 7. The base is correct, another 8 as well. Oh, mm. crunches very well. Let's go with an 8. Mm. And now let's see that cornicione. It looks very airy. I'll give it a 9. It also looks pretty firm, gets another 8 more. And again, the best part. The tomato is really good. Next up is a bread flour. It looks pretty good, so we give it a 9. Let's hear how this pizza crunches. <laughs> Let's go with an 8. But I think we can give it a 10. Once again we go with the scissors and cut that pizza crust. I thought it was going to be a little bit more airy. Mm, we give it a 7, okay? Mm. Yeah. Let's see how firm it is. We give it an 8. Mm. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I have to do it again. All-purpose flour, not the one that you always use to make pizza. Ooh. Looks amazing. It deserves another 10. Now I want to hear how it creaks. 9. The base, I'll give it an 8. Now let's cut the pizza crust and see how it is. This is another 10. I'll give it an 9. And of course I have to taste this one too. <laughs> Ooh. 
And finally we've come to the cake flour that I would never have thought of using for pizza. It's looking pretty good. Let's give it an 8. Oh no 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 no. Listen how it cricks. This is a 9. The base is not that bad. A 7. Mm. And now we need to see that cornichon. And another surprise. Let's give it a 9. We can all agree it did it very well. Let's give it an 8. I have to do it again. Oh. And here we have the table with all the final scores. Well, as expected, the winning flower had to be the Neapolitan. Let's keep in mind that it was born for that. But I also want to highlight that using other type of flowers that weren't designed to make pizzas, we can achieve incredible pizzas as well. So I hope you found this experiment helpful and see you in the next video. May the gluten be with you. So you want that your loaves look like this one, but instead they look like this. Stay watching this video and I'll show you how. What? What the f Okay, here is the loaf. So let's check our bread. What happened? It's hot. It looks like it's already cooked and it's light. But, but it doesn't look like a bread from a bakery, right? I cut it here, this was a slash, and it didn't open, and it also broke here on the top. A little bit ugly, right? So what does this team do in the oven? The main and most important thing is to keep the loaf during the baking process moist. We've seen in the first loaf that it got dry immediately and there was no ear and it didn't look that good. But then, if we add some water into the oven, the moment that we're putting the bread inside, this water will evaporate and maintain the crust still moist. And this will let the loaf grow and make this beautiful ear that we all love. Okay, now it's time to bake the second loaf. We'll do just one adjustment. Temperature is okay, the same, but we'll change. We'll stop the fan and put only heat on top on the bottom. No wind. And another thing, we have this tray on the bottom of the oven in which I'll put some water in the moment I'll put the bread in the oven. Let's go. Time for the water. Twenty minutes with steam, and then another twenty minutes more without steam. We're about two minutes to end the first part of the cooking process, which steam. Now I'll open the door, let the steam get out if there's still any, and then I'll put another twenty minutes more to let the baking finish. And here is the second loaf. <laughs> Told you so. Wow, nice piece of bread. It's whole. It's really, really hot. And check this ear. Incredible, big, incredible, gorgeous. The color is totally different as the first one. Really golden, beautiful. We nailed it. Let's continue. So here are the two loaves, and as I told you, it's the same method. So tell me which one was baked in the Dutch oven and which one was baked in the bag. Okay, just to let you know, this one was baked in the Dutch oven and this one in the bag. And as you see, both methods were the same. The loaves looks almost the same one. Really light, nice color, nice ear, the same here too. It's really, really hot. So it's a nice method and it's my favorite. <laughs> okay. Last minute, I'm gonna take out the last bread of the video. Okay, so finally here's the loaf after all the fighting and it's not that bad. 
as you can see, there's a small ear here on top of it, so it tried to open, but at the same time, this papillot just smash it. It's a little bit tall and not that wide. I think that the next time I try this papillot method, a little bit more better. Maybe you can try it at home and then tell me how did it go to you. Let's check out the breads, all right? So here we have the five loaves already baked. Here in the middle are the three ones that were baked with steam. On my left side, here's the loaf without steam. Direct steam method in the oven. Dutch oven. Baking bag. And papillot method. Luther Morgan, everyone. I am here in Manhattan, New York. I am about to visit Brett Bakery, one of the most famous bakery here in the city. So come and let's make a private tour. Okay, so as you can see, we have the, our French sourdough here. Mm -hmm. This has been uh, resting in the bowl for about three hours and a half. Hours. So and how many kilos do you have in here? This is 200 kilos. 200 kilos? So everything started at 6 a.m. We did the arrowies, which is water and flour only. Mm -hmm. After we added the, the sponge. The sponge. The sponge, and we have the gray salt here. And this is Yeah, this sea is straight from the, from the sea. sea. Yeah, sea salt. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah, so yeah, 200 kilos. We get about 220, 30 loaves of loaves, uh, 750. Wow. And the rest will be for 2.1 kilos. Okay. Loaves, yeah. Yeah, this is the dough we just finished mixing over there. The this 200 kilos of dough. Yeah, this is what we get out of that. What's the name of this dough. bread? This is here? called French sourdough. French sourdough. Yeah, this, this is a small version one. This is called small French sourdough. We also have large ones. It's like a mish. Yeah, it's in basically French, a mish. Yeah. yeah in and France, where do you, do you bake this one? Uh, here we the, bake it the in the oven. bongar, yeah. We, you know, put them on the belt, score mm -hmm. them. A good temperature around. If we talk about sales, it's about 280 to 500. Beautiful. Yes. And it's super lightweight. It's yeah. like 300 grams. After How baking, much do they it's now? Like, air. Yeah, it's all air. It's the way we bake it, yeah. Uh -huh. We have some halas here. Oh, uh -huh. So we are a Israeli slash French bakery, so we have a lot of Israeli Beautiful. products as well as French products. And this one with yeah. seeds. Yeah, sesame it's the seeds. same dough. It's the same ah, dough. Same the dough. only difference is that this contains sesame seeds. Uh -huh. Yeah, we dip Beautiful. them in sesame and, and then we bake Very light. Them. This is a famous pinza. If you want to learn how to bake it, keep watching this video. But first, let's see the formula. Remember that you can download my app free for Android or iPhone. In a bowl, we add the bread flour. Now the rice flour. Now we add the spelt flour or whole wheat flour or soy flour. A pinch of yeast. And we start adding the water very slowly. Not all at the beginning. With this Danish whisk, we start whisking the dough. We are mixing all the ingredients. At the beginning, this dough can look kind of dry. But wait, this is an 80% hydration dough, so wait till we add all the water. Now that the dough looks like a dough, let's put it on the counter. And now that the dough is on the table, I'll do some stretching and foldings, kind of Bertinet style or something like that. Now it's time to add the salt. I will mix it again, slowly. And finally, time to add the olive oil. Yes, it's a little bit messy, but it's working. Now that we're done with the dough, let's put it back in the bowl and cover it. And now we have to wait till the dough doubles in size. Take a look at that dough, it's huge. Now we divide it in pieces, of 270 grams. If you want more, it's okay. Now we do some stitches, giving it some tension with our hands. Dough ball ready. Now we put it in the container. So now that the dough ball is ready, we need to let it cold ferment for around one or two days. Now, to the oven. Now we let the pizza to cool down for a few minutes. Mm. 
It's incredible. I really need to take a picture of this. Just a second. How do you bake pizza? Well, today I'm going to show you that with the same ingredients and doing practically the same things, I am going to take that pizza to another level. Let's go with a classic Italian pizza. Pizza in Italia. Here you can see the formula, so you can upload it into my app. In the bowl, place a bigger and then add the remaining flour. Then the salt and start kneading. Immediately after, we are going to add the water little by little and see how the gluten develops. Now that the dough is formed, it's time to add the olive oil. We've got the dough and look at how strong it is. Wow, unbelievable. That's the magic of the gluten. Now a few folds, cover it and we'll take it to the fridge for a cold and overnight fermentation. And here it is again. Look at how much air that dough has. It couldn't be lighter. Stretching it with our fingers. I love this part. Tell me if it's not the best baking therapy one can do. A few flakes of salt and we're going to put a little olive oil on it. We take it to the preheated oven. Take a look at that slice. It's full of air. Now we are moving continents and we're going to make a Detroit classic. Here's a formula for you to add into my app. In a bowl, we're going to place all the flours, the fermented polish, salt and water. We are just going to integrate all the ingredients. Let's cover it and let it rest for an hour. We wet our hands and we're going to see the difference. And there you see it, the dough kneaded on its own. That's called autolyze. Uncover it again and let it rest for half an hour. And finally, and take a look at how huge it is now, full of bubbles. Now in a baking dish, we place a little olive oil and unmull the dough in there, very carefully so as not to lose all those fermentation gases. We arrange it a little bit with our hands and now we load it with mozzarella cheese. Yes, lots of cheese. The secret is to grate some parmesan cheese on the edges so they will become really, really crispy. And now it's time to take it to a preheated oven with the convection fan on. The truth is that this pizza looks incredible. That's where the pizza comes out. Incredible. <laughs> now we're going to cut it up. Didn't you? Now it goes on top. Yes, as you're watching right now, that's why I cut the pizza earlier. Now we add some grated parmesan cheese and look at this. Who doesn't love that melted cheese? And we've reached the last pizza, an Argentinian classic, the Fugaceta. And here's the formula for you to add it in my app as well. And this one, unlike the other two previous ones, we're going to make it just with yeast, but it's also going to be super lightweight. The secret will be to use a little yeast and ferment it for a long time. We slowly begin to integrate all the ingredients and immediately, as soon as the dough is formed, we lower it to the counter and start heating it with our hands. Yes, you have to knead it by hand, but believe me, and it's not going to be for that long. Okay, a couple more moves, a tap over here, and we're done. Transfer it to a bowl and cover it. We're going to let that dough triple in size. Any similarity was by accident. Now we slowly uncover the dough and take a look at it. Look at all the air in that dough. I told you, it was worth it. It looks like it's alive. Now we're going to divide it in half, but not into equal portions. We shape the dough balls, one bigger and one more smaller. And we're all set. The pizza base. Yes, don't be afraid to use it because there are no Neapolitans watching. We have it ready and now we transfer it to the pizza pan. Let's arrange it with our hands and that's all. We're going to start placing mozzarella. 
Yes, lots of it. We're going to load it with a lot of mozzarella cheese. And if you thought that the previous pizza had a lot, this one has a lot more. But it's going to look amazing. Yes, I know. I know what you're thinking. Let's continue and place the top. The secret is to close it perfectly so that all that cheese, when it melts, doesn't escape from the pizza. We make a small chimney on top of it and cover it with all that onion that we cut with the mandolin. A pinch of salt and a spritz of olive oil. Let's take it to the oven at 430 degrees Fahrenheit. This pizza is one of my favorites and I hope it's yours too. How cute that looks, doesn't it? Please raise your hand if you have ever seen a better explicit cheese scene than this one. But today I want to show you a new universe of freezing. I am going to show you five different ways on how to freeze your bread in all its processes. I am going to show you how to freeze a bread halfway through baking and finish it another day. Then I am going to bake a totally frozen bread straight into the oven. We'll see some tips that will come in handy at breakfast time. And finally, we're going to rate them in the gluten scale and see if there's one that I prefer the most. Let's go with the first method of bringing back to life a totally baked and frozen bread. It is a very useful method for those who compulsively keep bread in the freezer. You'll always have bread almost freshly baked. We're going to give it a 9. Let's go with the second method, where we make bread with a totally fermented dough, but frozen. This method can help us a lot in case we are working with some dough that we cannot continue. We freeze it and we simply come back to it later. We're going to give it a 10 on the gluten scale. Now we continue with the method of freezing a partially baked bread. This is the ideal method for those who want to have freshly baked bread at any time. What you have to take in account is to pre-bake that bread first. We're going to give this one an 8 on the gluten scale, but I think it could be a little bit more too. Now comes one of the most revolutionary methods of baking, a fully fermented but frozen bread. I think this method is very versatile, gives very good results and also a lot of freedom for the baker. So on the gluten scale, we're going to give it a 10. And now we come to the last method, which I think it's a classic having the slices previously cut and frozen ready for breakfast. And we're going to give it a 9 on the gluten scale. <laughs> what do you say? So these were the 5 methods I show you today on how to work with frozen bread. So you want to learn how to bake these soft and tender buns? I'm going to show you how to make the Obrador San Francisco typical bun. Panque mao. Flour. Red flour. Olive oil. Olive oil. Eggs. Eggs. Salt, cane sugar, baker yeast, and, and here's some, some water. water. Okay. Just to adjust the final okay. hydration. Okay, so well, let's start. Do you want to mix? Okay, with my hand. Of course. Eat this a lot at school, right? A lot of children was were eating this pan quemado. Yeah. Ah, good. <laughs> the French method. Let it rest. resting. Okay. Should I cover it for a few mm. minutes? The dog is smoother. Uh huh. Oh, it's really smooth. Time to add the sugar. The sugar. Okay. okay. Let's go. Gluten Morgan, Gluten Network. It has risen a little bit. It's starting to the fermentation. Yes, and it's this really bulk. smooth. It's going like to double or triple in size. Four, More? Five. Oh, four times? Five times? Maybe. Wow, only here in Madrid. Oh. Wow, what is this, Antonio? This Ooh. is the fermentation. Now it's huge, as you said. Yeah. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Let me put the dough on the counter. And then we are going to divide. Divide the dough, yes. And weight? 105 grams. 105 grams, not yeah. 100. 105. No, no, not at all. No, yeah. You can do <laughs> what you want. If you okay. want 200 grams or a big piece of half okay. a kilogram, we are going to do little bowls, not put both. it on the train, and on the tray, and then the last fermentation uh -huh. before the oven. So we can do it at room temperature 
or yeah. maybe you can retard this in, in cold fermentation and bake them tomorrow. Yeah, I like the, to use the fridge. The fridge. For comfort. It's your best friend, the fridge. No, my second best second friend. Second best friend. Okay, let's take it to the fridge. Oh, they're huge and oh. they're cold. Yeah. Ah, okay, so they're almost ready to go to yeah. the oven, right? We just need the final, final touch. Some egg. Egg, it's so like an egg wash. Some sugar, yeah. I can't resist, Antonio. I need to try this now. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but don't worry, gluten, because I have a solution. I present to you Gluten Morgan Baker's Percentage, which is a tool for calculating bread recipes, such as the one we've seen now. And it comes with a lot of preloaded recipes, such as Rookbrot, which is rye bread, the typical Neapolitan pizza, but the most important thing is that this app is a tool for you to add your own recipes or the ones that we show in our channel. For example, let's make a new recipe. We go to the menu and press here. Now it says create a new recipe. This is really, really easy. What we need to do first is to name it. So we'll write perfect loaf. Then the main ingredient should be bread flour. And now the percentage, which should be around 90. Now we can add easily a new ingredient, just like this. For example, whole wheat flour. And there should go 10%. Why? Because 90 plus 10 is 100. Remember that the flowers should always sum 100. Let's add a new ingredient and that should be water. The usual hydration should be around 70, that's okay. Now we add another main ingredient which is sourdough starter and that should be around 20%. And now the last ingredient, salt. So now we have the full recipe, let's save it. So now if we go to the end of the menu, we'll see our new recipe. You can see our recipe with the decimals too. It is really, really exact. For example, if we want to make one loaf and the loaf should weigh around 500 grams and the app will calculate all the ingredients for us with extremely accurate numbers. So now let's see, we want to make three loaves of 500 grams each, that should be 1,500 grams. And then here's the new calculation. Really easy, really fast. Maybe we want to change something in the recipe, then we go to the menu and press here the edit tool. So here we can change all the ingredients. For example, we want to change the bread flour and instead use some rye flour. Or maybe we want to change the percentage of the water. For example, 78%. Or for example, we want to switch the order of the ingredients, we press here on the menu and we just slide it up or down. We can also add a note to the recipe. We save the note. Now we save again the recipe. Now, if we want to check it, we go to the recipe and here we have the new order of the ingredients and also the note. Another thing very interesting in the app is that you can share the recipe with other chat applications or maybe in the notepad. Another feature very important is that you can go here to the main menu and export all the recipes like this, just like this. And you can then easily import them back. Basically, this is how the app works. Remember that you can download for free this app for Android or iPhone. I'll see you on the next video. Do you want to know how to make these incredible hot dogs at home? Keep watching this video and I'll show you how. And here I present to you my super secret hot dog formula.
So here is the dough, and I want you to see how soft and tender it is. See, oh, no, not that close. The dough, the dough, feel this. That's the power of the yum. Okay, here I have the three pieces, and now let's start making the dough balls. There are many ways to make these dough balls, but the first one is like this. You take all the edges here into the center, making some stitches. Okay, when it's done, let's flip it over and finish it with our hands. First dough ball ready. But they're making hot dogs. Yes, wait a minute. So let's take the ball and now we'll shape it like if we were doing a little baguette. See how easy it is. So good, this is the final shape of our gorgeous hot dog buns. Let's put some oil. and let them rest here on the tray. Now we're going to brush them really gently, like this. That we'll put on top of our beautiful bread. Take a look at the buns, they have already doubled the size. So now I have the oven, which is preheated at 160 degrees centigrade, which in Fahrenheit is... Let's put them inside the oven and may the gluten be with them. Whoa, 15 minutes and I'll see you then. Okay, the hot dog buns are ready. Let's take them out of the oven. Oh, they are beautiful. And take a look at them. They're already cooled down. See how beautiful is this grated and golden cheese that we have on top of the bread. It's so tender. And inside is super moist because of the yum. And it's a pizza video. So let's start. Download my app so you can add it into your recipe book because this application is also like a recipe book. I have the, the flour here. I'll put some yeast. You don't have to use this much. It's just a little bit, not too much. We're making one kilo uh, dough. So that's enough. Well, maybe this one. And the water of this dough is going to be a little bit more um, with chunks. All these ingredients and try to, uh, to, to the flour to absorb the water. And now I will close it and I'll leave it here at room temperature which should be around uh, 25 degrees Celsius. 14 hours, 16 hours, 18 hours. It depends mostly on the, how much yeast I've used. So as you've seen, I used just a little bit and the temperature. And here is the final biga. So here we have the biga and look how it looks one day before. It's almost the same thing as I started a few seconds ago, but it is, it is fermented. As you, see, as you can see, here are some little bubbles. Let me check here too. It's like a, like a bread. <laughs> well, this is, this is dough, so it's close to a bread. We'll put these small chunks here in the, in the bowl of the mixer. Tin with a little bit more of flour, not too much, just a little bit, and start the mixer slowly, and start adding water. Not all the water, just a, li a little bit. So now it's time to add the olive oil. And now comes the best part. Okay, done. For a few hours till it doubles in size like this. Woo! Done. <laughs> Let's start making these dough balls. I take all the edges <clears throat> to the center. I make some stitches here. This is really, really easy. Wow, look here, yeah, incredible. And now we flip it and we make the ball. 
really easy. The dough is beautiful. Look at this. It's like a like a, a ball, like a slime. One thing, I have these little jars here that will help us them to ferment slowly and not getting dry. I use olive oil because it's more Italian. And then I'll put the balls here in each one in one container. Two and three. Well, this one was a little bit bigger. So now finished, close the lids and whoop, ready. Good. So now what's go what's going to happen here? <clears throat> we need them we need lit, uh, we need them to rise. And this will take if we leave them here at room temperature, maybe in two hours we are ready to start baking pizza. But if you want to go to another level and make the a game changer in your pizza life, what I recommend is to take this immediately to the fridge until tomorrow and give them 24 more hours of fermentation. So now we've been two days baking pizza. By the magic of the gluten here, <laughs> my three dough balls already fermented at room temperature. That's another thing interesting that you should you should uh, let them, you should take them out of the fridge just one hour before you want to uh, bake pizza. To uh, take it out of the mold. Okay, so we put it on the on the semolina really fast. Let's see how much air does it have. Move it here again. And now that it's all full of semolina, I'll put it on the counter. And I'll start stretching it. Look all the air that we have. This air comes all for this slow and cold fermentation. Then with the biga. Do you remember the biga that we started at the beginning of the video? <laughs> okay, so long ago. So that's the biga and this is the motor of the pizza. That's it, the motor of the pizza. So, I'll start stretch, stretching it. I won't do it uh, round. Okay, perfect size. The dough has a perfect size of, of the peel and the peel has a perfect size for the baking dough. Look at the color that it has. It is incredible, this color, I love it. We put it this way so I can use the whole peel on it. Whoa, perfect. And ooh, slide it here, done. Now that the pizza is hot, we need to put this prosciutto, which is at room temperature, but let this heat finish and make this fat to melt a little bit on top of the pizza. Ah, this prosciutto, Italian prosciutto. Whoa, whoa. Here, some more. Burrata here, some more burrata here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. There. More here. Another one here. Mm -hmm. This is getting beautiful. Did you hear that crunch? <laughs> I tell you. Wow. Look here this. Ooh. <laughs> this is the cornichone that I was talking about. So now comes the best part, I, I mean for me, to try this th thing, this pizza, this Roman pizza, and fly straight to Rome with non-stop and a non-stop flight. Okay. Mm. Oh. Mm. Mm. Guten Morgen everyone, I'm here at New Jersey in front of Rasa, the pizzeria of my friend Dan Richer, and he's going to give us a masterclass in pizza, so come with me. Yeah, so this is an all-purpose flour, and then we have a high extraction wheat here. It's uh, spring wheat. We have some whole spelt flour. Ah, spelt flour. Yeah, uh, and then we have our sourdough starter. The um, hydration, it's, it's around 60%. 60%. Yeah. And then a little bit of salt, yep. right? Let's start with the dough. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, so we have water. We're, we're shooting for about... This is tap water. This is tap water, okay. absolutely. Yeah, so we're going to add our flour, mm -hmm. and we're going to add all three flours right now. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you could add your sourdough starter now, mm -hmm. uh, but I like to do an auto lease. Yeah. And I do auto lease with the starter too. That works too. That right is, now it looks like a bigger. It looks very, very dry. Mm -hmm. But as the starch yeah. hydrates, it's gonna it's gonna loosen up. Loosen up. Yeah. And that's it. And now we're just gonna wait. We're gonna wait 20 minutes. Our auto lease is finished. Uh, and then we're gonna add our sourdough starter. Yeah. Right here, and we're gonna add our salt also. Ah, at the same time, okay. Finally, four hours later. Yes. We ready. had a lot of pizza in the middle. So I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of flour, just to keep it nice and dry. And then normally we use a scale to weigh out yeah. each one. We go about 265 grams. Normally we weigh out yeah. every single piece, but. Yeah, yeah. Not uh, today. Not today. <laughs> so now we're gonna shape it into a ball. Mm -hmm. And give it some tension. Exactly. There's a million ways to do this. Mm -hmm. So you use only flour, not semolina? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just regular flour. Mm -hmm. The same flour for the pizza. Yeah, it, it all works. works. Yeah. So now we let them rest again. Yep. Now we're gonna. How many hours now? We're gonna cover it up. So we're gonna give this probably another hour at room hour. temperature. Okay. And then we're gonna refrigerate it until tomorrow. So now we are making the other important part of, or ingredient of the pizza. Yeah, so we're stretching mozzarella now. Oh. And we're slowly bringing it up to temperature before we start to stretch it. Very similar to gluten, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. But our protein here is casein. Mm -hmm. So we need to get the proteins to align and to bond. Mm -hmm. And that happens through movement, but also through temperature. Yeah. Yeah, I love uh, learning about cheese making. And the more I learn about it, the more similar mm -hmm. I realize it is I to- I think cheese to... making is going to be my next hobby. That's, that's, that's really a good one. Cheese. About 70 grams of yes. mozzarella. Not too much, not too many. Exactly. So we're gonna drizzle a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, mm -hmm. just a tiny bit to help it bake. There's a fine and it's line. Bubbling. Yeah, it's a fine line. Between burnt and uh, yeah. really deep caramelization. No, but it's looking gorgeous. So now I want to get it off the floor and just get a little bit more caramelization on the top. It's beautiful. Let some of the steam dissipate. Mm -hmm. And the base doesn't get moist, Soggy. right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, I like this part. So I love this when it's structurally sound enough to pick it uh -huh. up with your hands. And it doesn't fall that much. No. It's, in the middle. it's not a Neapolitan, Neapolitan, whoa. Yeah. I'm gonna use two less pieces of cheese. Uh, and maybe two. Maybe <laughs> a hair less sauce on the next uh -huh. one. Ooh. Oh, no, no. You really know about pizza. If there is a complicated bread to bake, is the baguette. So today, I am here to give you a hand with just that. I am not going to bake just one baguette. I am going to bake them in eight different ways. I am going to bake them in a home oven adding steam. Then I am going to use a Dutch oven and a crock pot. I am also going to bake them in an oven bag. I will bake some in a pastry convection oven. Obviously, I am going to use my deck oven too. Others I will bake in a small countertop oven. And finally, in the most unthinkable one. So let's get started and may the gluten be with you. For today's recipe, we're going to use bread flour, a little semolina, salt, water, some optional dry yeast, and obviously a very active sourdough starter. In the mixing bowl, we add the flour. We continue with the semolina. Now with the active sourdough starter, now comes a pinch of yeast, salt, and let's turn it on. 
We immediately add the water very little by little, and that method is known as bassinage. Now we put it into a bowl and let it rest for two hours. Now with wet hands, we're going to take the dough and fold it a few times. This way, we're going to interwind the gluten network and we're going to give it much more tension. Now, we cover it and we take it immediately to the... the... What? well... Uh, the... fridge, yes. And the next day, we're going to find this dough. Look at how it is. It's full of air. Let's carefully unmold the dough. We arrange it a little and prepare to cut into portions. Each one will weigh around 200 grams. Now, let's pre-shape the baguette. A very important step when making this type of bread. Now it's time to shape the baguettes. We're going to do it by rolling them onto themselves and thus we're going to give them tension and strength. With both hands from the center and out, we will give them the final shape. It is key not to squeeze too much. We're going to transfer them one by one to the kush so that they rest for a while before going to the oven. And after a long day of baking, here we have the eight baguettes. Please tell me if you don't notice the difference between one and the other. Each one has its own personality, each with its own style. Let's take a look to the one that we made first, in the home oven with steam. At first sight, we can tell that it's pretty good. It has a nice ear, good volume, a nice color, and it is super light. Now let's move on to the one baked in the Dutch oven, which looks kinda good. Nice volume, a very nice ear too, and above all, very lightweight. Perhaps the crust was subtly less toasted than the previous one. Let's now take a look at the baguette made in the crock pot. I think that what happened here is that the lid couldn't maintain all the gases in it. The result would have been different. Anyway, it's not so bad. Now we move to the oven bag method. And I hope that you agree with me, it is one of the most beautiful ones. I really like everything. The volume it reached, the oven spring it had, how the ear turned out the color of the crust, which we turn it into a non-convection oven. The method has a lot of potential, but some adjustments need to be made. However, the baguette is not so bad. It is very lightweight and can be perfectly eaten. Now let's take a look at the baguette made on the deck oven, which would be the most professional method. Let's be honest, this baguette ended up looking as it's supposed to be. Nice color, perfect oven spring, beautiful ear, and most importantly, lightweight. And here comes the revelation of this video. Using a countertop oven, we showed that we can really make a good baguette without having a super oven. And you're seeing the result right here. A good looking baguette with a beautiful ear, golden crust, good size, and of course lightweight. And now we've reached the laugh method. The least thought of all these methods, a baguette made in a pizza oven. While that oven was prepared for high temperatures, we managed to hack it and accommodate it a little bit. The result was a slightly more rustic baguette, but the truth is, it's not so bad. And here we have them all. I would like you to leave me in the comments which is the method that you like the most. Now, let's see how the crumbs are looking. This is a style of crumb that I like. A really open crumb and very airy. Beware of the crumb of the Dutch oven, really interesting and the crumb of the crock pot could not develop so well because the crust dried out ahead of time. Attention to the crumb made in the baking bag. I knew that the crust of the deck oven was going to be superior. The crumb of the convection oven turned into a non-convection oven is not that bad. I knew that the crust of the deck oven was going to be superior. Look at this crumb made in a countertop oven. I can't believe it. Take a look at the crumb we achieved on a pizza oven. Wow! <laughs> Do you want to know how to make this incredible burger and the burger bun? Keep watching this video and I'll show you how. Here is my secret burger bun recipe. That's the power of the yum. Yummy.
It's really easy. Basically, there are two ways to do it. The first one is flattening this dough and then taking all the edges into the center and making some stitches. When we have all the stitches there, we flip it over and then we finish it with our hands. See that I am not using any more flour or oil. The final touch and see how tense is the dough ball. This is really important in order that the bun doesn't explode or open in the oven. And the other way to shape the burger bun is just picking up the dough ball and start kneading with your hands. Just using these two fingers, like this. There, finished. Another secret is that the surface should be like this, spotless. This will make the best homemade burger bag. Okay, aren't they beautiful? So I put them here on the tray and let them grow till they double in size. We have to wait. Good, now the buns have doubled in size, so I have the oven preheated at 160 degrees centigrade, which is in Fahrenheit. So let's put them in the oven. I'll see you in 15 minutes. May the gluten be with them. Okay, time to take them out of the oven. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Let's go. And take a look at this beautiful burger pan. Wow. Isn't it gorgeous? Do you want to know which is the best hydration for the flour that you have? Stay watching this video and I'll show you a little test that you can make at home. Okay, so let's start with the first dough, the 60% hydration. 100 grams flour and 60 grams of water. And now we just need to mix this. We are not kneading, we are just mixing. We are hydrating the flour with the water. In this case, 60%, as you can see, it's a very stiff, Dough. And that's all by the moment. So now what we have to do is to cover it with a plastic bag or a cloth and leave it here on the counter for around one hour. And now let's move on to the 70% hydration, which means 100 grams of flour and 70 grams of water. And now mixing. Remember, mixing, not kneading. Now with 70% hydration, it's much easier. <laughs> to start the dough. Let's cover it and leave it here on the counter for one hour. Time for the last dough of the day, 80% hydration. And as before, mixing, cover and leave it here one hour. And by the magic of the gluten, it's been one hour and we have the three doughs already utilized. The 60% hydration dough, 70% hydration dough, and the 80% hydration dough. So let's check the 60% hydration dough. As I told you, the autolyze did its job, and the dough is already kneaded by itself. So now we start stretching it with our hands without breaking this gluten network and see how much we can stretch it. It's almost translucent and now it's beginning to tear apart, but not that much. This means that 60% hydration is okay for this flour. Test one, passed. Let's wet again and let's go with the 70% hydration dough. Wow, take a look at it. It's already kneaded. That's the magic of the autolyze. So now we start stretching it again and look, it's developing incredibly this gluten network. Take a look at this. Can't believe it. Look, it's almost translucent. This means that 70% hydration for this flour is okay. Test number two, passed. 
And now the final dough, 80% hydration. It's a little bit more sticky, but it's already developed. Take a look at this gluten network. Wow. Oh, this flour is excellent. Great hydration, great dough, great flour. So in this test that I did today, for me the right hydration would be this one in the middle, which is not too hydrated, not too low hydrated. 70% hydration is okay, but it also depends on which type of bread that you want to make. Which other language do you speak? English, French, French? Do you speak so, French? so it's a really good question. I think I only speak French and English at the end of the day. When I was in school, I took Spanish and there was a moment in my life where I was reasonably <laughs> well versed in Spanish. Yes. And I can't say that I, I know Spanish. Do you understand? I do. Si hablo español. <laughs> si. Quiero una cerveza. And yes, that too, but a little later. <laughs> Good testing. Apolonia Polan is part of the third generation of bakers in the Polan family. Author and CEO, Apolonia had to take over the Polan empire at the age of 18 after an unexpected situation. Since taking over, she had succeeded in transforming a bakery full of history into the most famous baker in France. Today, they have five stores throughout Paris. And now we'll dive into the story of Poilan, the artwork made out of bread by Dali, and how she managed to take over an empire while studying at Harvard. This is the Gluten Podcast with you, Apolonia Poilan. ¿Cuál es tu pan favorito? Ah, <laughs> good question. Um, you understood. I did understand. <laughs> I did understand everybody. So I think I honestly think that the bread that I prefer is depends on what I put with it mm -hmm. or the moment I eat it with. Because like in the mornings, I want to have something that's like nice and will start my day, fill in my stomach, and then I can go and run around the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, maybe later in the evening, I want something lighter. But it's also nice to have a little slice of brioche that's well-baked or mm -hmm. and toasted in the morning. I so I thought I understood. So I like to have a little bit of a sommelier's approach to bread baking uh, and to bread and tasting. And I'm going to sound pompous for a second, but the thing is, certain ingredients, certain foods suit better certain grains. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you're going to go at length of having a nice quality bread, why not go that extra step and just choose the right grain? Mm -hmm. So, of course, there's the moment of the day and what you're looking for. So. If it's the mornings and I'm going to have, I have a long day ahead, I, I will want to have a bread that's going to really feed me and carry me through lunch. And if I've had a really lazy morning and it's almost noon and I need to have a quick bite before I have lunch, then maybe just a slight toast of brioche mm -hmm. um, and just that simple tartine, a thick slice of brioche toasted on either side so that it's nice and golden on the outside and nice and moist from the butter on the inside, that's also quite divine. So now is why I'm going to show you today three new sandwich loaf recipes. And for all levels, from beginners to experts. In the mixer bowl, we start by placing 550 grams of bread flour. We continue with 8 grams of yeast, 35 grams of sugar, 10 grams of salt, 30 grams of powder milk, and 140 grams of mashed potatoes. It's not really mashed potatoes. It's just boiled potatoes smashed down with any other condiments. And now we go with 60 grams of eggs. Yes, everything needs to be measured. I prepare the mixer and instead of the hook, I will use the paddle because I like it much more for this style of preparation. I turn it on and then add 140 grams of water. If you see that the dough is a little bit dry, then add a few droplets of water. When the dough has already formed, we increase the speed and add 35 grams of butter. While we wait, let's size this moment to read this cute book about sourdough bread. Who might have written it? About 15 minutes later, we will have the dough ready. We can divide it immediately in three equal parts. We shape the balls, giving them some tension with our own hand. And it's ready. With some extra flour and a rolling pin, we're going to stretch them one by one to a thickness of about 5 millimeters. Then we're going to fold them on one side and then the other, and finally, we roll them up. Tell me if it doesn't look very easy. Now we do some stitches, we pat it, and we have the three rolls ready. Here they go in a mold previously buttered. Like if we were Dali, we paint the three rolls with egg wash, which is simply a mixture made with equal parts of egg and milk. Now we cover the mold and let it double in size. Isn't it cool how fast things get done on video? I'm amazed by the power of editing. Well, let's move on to the oven. Now we take the loaf to bake for 30 minutes at 356 degrees. 
And here we have it. Look at the amazing golden color it has. <laughs> it really looks beautiful, but we need it to let it cool down. Now let's move on to level 2, the Hokkaido bread. In a pan we place 35 grams of bread flour and 160 grams of water. With a spatula we will mix very carefully until we get a creamy texture. The key is not to exceed 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Ready, time to let it cool, where we are going to place 460 grams of bread flour, 50 grams of sugar, 10 grams of salt, 8 grams of yeast, the tansong already cooled down, and 40 grams of egg. Yes, we have to wait it again. We turn the machine on and we add 200 grams of milk. Now we turn up the speed and as soon as we see that the dough is formed, we add the butter, which is 40 grams. Yes, that little piece that got stuck there also bothers me. Isn't it a nice gluten network? Very well. Now we transfer the dough to another bowl, cover it and leave it there until it doubles in size. Look how amazing this dough looks. Now we lower it to the counter and divide it in three equal parts. Obviously, it is always good to weigh them. And now we shape the three bands this way, giving them tension. We can also give them an extra touch with our hands, always with lots of style. Let's go with the rolling pin again and with a little extra flour, we start stretching these bands. The thickness we are looking for will also be about 5 mm. We fold them on one side and now on the other and immediately after we roll them up on themselves. We are going to do this with the three balls and we cannot forget about the gluten touch. Perfect, we already have all three. Now we prepare the mold, which we can do with all spray, although I don't recommend it. Ok, now we can place the three rolls in there and we are going to brush them with egg wash. Now we cover it and we are going to leave it there until it doubles in size. And by the magic of the gluten, here we have our Hokkaido bread back, totally proofed. Time to take it into the oven at 356 degrees for 30 minutes and may the gluten be with it. Here we have it back and it looks amazing. We're going to have to let it cool down, it smells incredible. Level 3, pan de mie or sandwich loaf, 550 grams of bread flour, 8 grams of sugar, 10 grams of salt, 6 grams of yeast, and 65 grams of sourdough starter. How sexy it looks! We turn on the mixer at speed 1 and immediately add 330 grams of water and we do it at a slow pace. As soon as the dough is formed, we add 30 grams of butter. Now we lower the dough to the counter, shape it, transfer it into a ball and cover it so that it doubles in size. And here it is back. I am amazed by how fast those rise on video. We divide it into three equal portions, but as you already know, it is always better to weight them. Now we form the three balls giving tension with our hand. Very well, now that they are ready, we put on some extra flour and with the help of a rolling pin, we stretch them. Ideally, they should have, as always, 5 mm in thickness. Now we fold one side inward and do the same with the other. And we roll them on themselves, one by one, very slowly. Yes, I like that. Meanwhile, we prepare the mold with all spray and place the three rolls which we are going to brush with egg wash. This will give them a nice color and also protect them to avoid from getting dry. Ok, now we cover it and let it rise until it doubles in size. And here it is back. No need to tell you again that it was because of the magic of the gluten. Or should I do it? Now we are ready to take the bread to the oven, preheat it to 356 degrees for 30 minutes. And here we have it. And it's so cute that I'll make it parade it on my counter. The truth is that I love it and it makes me want to try it out right now. And we're going to try them all together at the end of the video. If you love bread and butter, this video is for you. It is time to start the experiment, but first let's check the formula. And here it is. As you can see, it's a regular formula with 70% hydration, which is ok for sourdough bread. And as you can see, we have 10% of fat. Some kind of breads use 5, 6, 8% and as I told you before, the panettone uses sometimes up to 60% fat. So, 10% fat, it's ok for today. And of course, I'll be adding the fat or the oil as soon as the dough has a little development.
Okay, done dough number one. So now what I'm going to do is to leave the dough here on the counter for around four hours doing bulk fermentation. Now it's time to continue with the other doughs. The only thing is that I'll be changing the fat. It's been four hours and here I have the four doughs with their four fats. It's their fourth four? Whoa, take a look at it. It's full of air and full of bubbles. Let's put it on the counter. And now I'm feeling something strange, something new. Of course, I have a new ingredient. But it's okay, time to shape it. Let's fold one side. Let's fold the other side. Rolling. Now finishing the ends. Some flour on top of it. On the banneton too. And now let's put it in there. It's time for the margarine dough. Oh, it looks fantastic too. Full of air. Ah, I love this. But it's time to shape it. Let's put it on the counter and what? Hmm, it is too stretchable. And uh, let's start shaping. Now it's time for the fat bread, or the animal fat bread. Oh, this fermentation is looking really good. But it's time to shape it. Let's put it on the counter. And now we're talking. This dough, it's tighter than the other one. Let's shape it. Rolling, finishing the ends, some flour there. Okay, last dough of the day. Oh, it looks so oh, interesting. Okay, but let's shape it. Let's put it on the counter and what? <laughs> oh, the oil has really, really stretched this dough. Okay, let's shape it. One side, half side. Now rolling, mm, yeah, done. Let's close the ends, mm, or something. A little bit of flour here on the banneton too, and strip, done. Okay, time to check this, the butter one. As you can see, it's a little bit flat, but it's light at the same time. The smell, smells like butter. This is incredible. Mm, the shape, mm, this is, there's some kind of ear here, but I think that the butter or the melting point of the butter did something strange with the gluten network. Let's open it up and taste the crumb. Mm. Let's check the inside. At first sight, what I see is that we have no open crumb at all, but it's really well fermented and it's very moist, tender, fluffy. Now time for the second bread of the day, the margarine one. It looks kind of a little bit more better than the other one. Maybe the melting point of the margarine is better for the gluten network as the butter one. Color perfect, it is light, it is, wow. Did you hear this? I think we should open it up and check the crumb. Let's check this crumb. Oh, super fluffy too. It looks like more like the butter one. It's the same thing, but the smell, mm, the smell is another thing. But I like the shape. It's a little bit less flatter than the other one. Okay, it's time for the fat bread or the animal fat bread. This one is looking kind of good. It looks more like a bread now. We have some here. The color is interesting and the crust, it, it feels dry. It feels different than the other one. And it's light, it sounds hollow. Let's open it up. Okay, so let's check the inside. At first sight, the crumb is really, really regular. It is well fermented although, but it's not the open crumb that I'm used to. The crust is really thin and, wow, crunchy. 
Yes, and it's really, really tender. It smells like pan de la campagne. At first sight, it's a little bit flat, but it has some volume too. Here's some kind of ear. It's light, hollow. It was really complicated to shape it, as you've seen, because of the oil. It's more meant it for pizza focaccia or ciabatta when you want to stretch it a lot. Well, that's what happened in this kind of bread. So that's why we have this kind of UFO. Okay, let's check the ground. Ta-da! Uh -huh. Time to check this crumb too. It's not an open, open crumb, but it's more open than the other ones. And it's super fluffy and tender and crispy at the same time. Oh, it smells great. It's like a pizza bread. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another baking video. When we talk about bread, we're talking about France. That's why I'm here in Paris. I'm about to visit here in Paris Saint Boulangerie Bakeries and I'm going to taste there the best baguette and the best croissant. And now we're going to see which one is the best baguette. And it was really hard to make this baguette ranking because all the bread was so good. And on the last place, the baguette of La Parisienne, which I really expected a little bit more since it was the winner in 2016. In fourth place, we have the baguette of L'Essentiel, which was really good. Nice and crispy crust and a beautiful open crown. And on the third place, we have the baguette of the French Bastard, which doesn't look like a traditional baguette from France, but the crust was so thin and crispy and the crown was so moist and airy. And in second place we have the baguette of Jolie Miche, which maybe wasn't the best one on the outside, but in the inside was really incredible. Trust me, it was beautiful. In first place we have Arthur, Patisserie and Boulangerie. What I loved of this baguette was the golden and crispy crust. It was so thin and crispy, and the open crumb was so moist and creamy. And now we're going to see which is the best croissant. And on the last place we have the croissant of La Parisienne, which happened the same thing with the baguette. I think there was something missing on it. Number six we have Arthur Croissant, which on the outside looks beautiful, but the crumb was a little bit dry and not too open. And on the fifth place we have the croissant of L'Essentiel, which was really huge, full of crispy layers and a beautiful open crumb. And on the fourth place we have the Baptiste croissant, which really looks like a traditional Parisian croissant. And what I found incredible was that open crumb. And on the third place we have the croissant of Poilin, which doesn't look too traditional, but it was so light and really, really tasty. On the second place we have the Jolie Miche croissant with a zillion layer of buttery and crispy goodness. Maybe it had not the best open crumb, but it was really, really tasty. And in the first place we have the croissant of the French Bastards with that golden color and those crispy and crunchy layers. And that crazy and open crumb with that buttery taste was really incredible. You should try this one when in Paris. So you want to learn how to make these incredible grilled pizzas? Stay watching this video and I'll show you how. To start with the dough, which is really easy to do, we just need some all-purpose flour, 
a little bit of water, olive oil, instant yeast and salt. In a bowl with the flour we add the instant yeast, then we add the salt and some of the water. Then we start mixing with our hands. The rest of the water will be adding it very slowly and this is called bassinage. This is a very easy and simple dough to do. There's no need to knead too much, there is also no need for stretching and folding. We don't even need to develop too much of the gluten network too, because it's going to be a thin and crispy pizza base. After mixing for a few minutes, it is time to add the olive oil. Sometimes we add oil in the doughs because it makes them more stretchable. If you don't have olive oil, you could use perfectly canola oil or the one that you have at home. Now we lower it into the counter and we start kneading with our hands for a few minutes more. Perfect, we have a beautiful pizza ball. Now we put it back in the bowl and let it proof until it doubles in size. Now that the dough has risen, it's time to start stretching the pizzas. We divide the dough and shape three 500 grams pizza balls. Now we give them some tension like we do when we make bread. There we go, one ball, two balls, three balls. Now, while we prepare the rest of the ingredients, let them rest for a few minutes. Since I am not Italian and we are not making Neapolitan-style pizza, we can use a rolling pin to stretch our pizza dough. The idea is to make them really thin, about 5 mm thin. Using some flour on the bench, we'll go slowly stretching the three balls. And here you have the three pizzas already stretched and ready to be baked. But before we start baking, we need to arrange the fire. We'll move it to one side and we'll keep the hot cold under the grill. And now we lower it to start warming up. Now we are ready to place the pizza doughs on the grill. We're going to bake them on one side, because on that side is where we're going to put all the ingredients. Time to start making the pizza. Let's go first with the tomato sauce, some mozzarella cheese, tomato slices, always garlic, some salt, pepper, some parmesan cheese and fresh basil. Let's make a second pizza. The first layer should be the stracciatella cheese. Now we continue with the caramelized onions. Don't forget the garlic. And here comes the blue cheese. What do you think about putting some olives? Now a pinch of salt, black pepper, and some parmesan cheese. And a final touch of dried oregano. And now we go with the last pizza. Some tomato sauce, of course grinded mozzarella. Here comes the mushrooms and the smoked ham. Now we continue with the chives, a pinch of salt and some parmesan cheese. And now it's time to finish those pizzas. Here they go. Hmm, <laughs> looking good, right? <laughs> And now comes the best part, tasting it. Let's go with pizza number two. Okay, let's go with the last pizza. So you want to know how to make this incredible pizza bachata? Stay watching this video and I'll show you how. And here is the formula. Remember that you can download totally free my app Gluten Morgan Baker's Percentage for Android or iPhone. In a bowl, we put the flour. Now we add this little amount of yeast. And now the water. We start mixing. The dough is very dry. We'll cover it and leave it overnight and tomorrow we'll start with the dough. 
Good morning everyone and welcome to another day and as I can see I have the missing plus already prepared. Come and take a look at the big guy. It hasn't grown that much but it's a little bit fluffy. Time to start with the dough. In the mixer bowl we put the big guy. I recommend to put it in small pieces because it's going to be much easier this way. Now we add half of the flour and the sourdough starter. Now we start the machine and slowly add some water. The idea is not to add all the water at the same time. We need to go adding the water slowly. Now it's time to add the rest of the flour and some water too. We need to go check in when the flour needs more water. If it's okay, please don't add it all. And now we add the salt. And finally, the olive oil. A few minutes more and it's done. So the dough is almost ready. So what is going to happen now is that the dough is going to start proofing. So maybe I'll do one or two stretching and foldings. And as soon as I see that it's starting to raise, then I'll put it in my fridge for one or two days. So I'll see you tomorrow. Good morning everyone, it's been 24 hours and here is the dough. What? The doughs. Wow, this is the magic of the gluten. So now I have four doughs. So what do you say if we make one? No, let's make two incredible and extra extra large pizza bachata. Wow, take a look at this. Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. Look at all these bubbles. This is because of the bigger and the sourdough starter and the long and cold fermentation. Yes, some semolina flour on the counter. It is full of air. More semolina on top of it. And take a look how fluffy is this. Wow. And now comes the best part. Ah, I love doing this. It's much better than going to the shrink. <laughs> and now on the tray some olive oil. Yes, always use olive oil. So let's put some olive oil here. Let's put it on a tray. Now, some more oil so they don't get stuck one to each other. And here comes the bacio, il bacio alla italiana. See how easy it is to stretch this dough. Final stretchings. Okay, so the oven is preheated at 482 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 250 degrees Celsius, so... Okay, first pizza bachata coming up.
And now the best part of the video, slicing it and tasting it. Pizza baciata e puro amore. Mm. Mm, mm. Do you want to know how to make the perfect burger but better? Okay, I'm not going to make one, not two, just three. Just leave it there. Here is the recipe. And remember that you can download my app Gluten Morgan Baker's Percentage for free for Android or iPhone. Let's go with the sugar. Now let's go with the salt. Let's continue with the yeast. Now the honey goes in. Okay, now that the dough balls are ready, I'll put them on this silicone mat, or in case you don't have one, you could put it on the tray, but always oiled. Now we leave them covered here on the counter till they double in size, and then we continue. Wow, so here I am with the buns already fermented, they have double in size and they are ready to go to the oven. But before they go to, into the oven, we need to do something else. We need to boil them in order to make this pretzel kind of bun. If you want to see my real pretzel recipe, you should check this video here. Today we'll be making some pretzel more like bagel treatment, which is just a solution of water and baking soda. The water's boiling, so now we add the baking soda and check that, wow, a lot of bubbles. Now with a spatula, we pick very gently one of our buns and we bathe it in this solution. Now we flip it and the other side. And now we take it off the water and put it here on the tray. Now it's time to paint them. We'll be using this egg wash, which is equal parts of egg and milk. So we start painting all of them. This is going to give them even a better color. And now it's time to sprinkle some sea salt. I am using salt flakes, but you can use kosher salt or the one that you have. And now with these scissors, let's make these cuttings. So here they go for 15 minutes. See you! Okay, burger buns done! There's another surprise. We're not going to make patties as I said. We're going to make balls. Yes, because today we are doing smashed burgers. So let's start with the first one. We're going to wait. 100 grams. Another important thing is to press it a lot. We don't want it to tear apart when we are grilling it. This ball needs to be really, really tight like this. Ball number two, the fatty one. So we take 100 grams too. And it really feels different. I can feel the fat on my fingers. 100 grams. And we have to press it up. It's like a meatball. <laughs> this is a meatball, but for smashing. Mm -hmm. 
And now the third one, the mixed one, 50 and 50. So we take 50 grams of lean beef. There, perfect. And 50 grams of fatty beef. Good. Now it is really important to mix them quite well. And now I'll brush them with melted butter. Time to start burger number one, the lean beef. On the bottom bun we put some Gluten Morgan secret sauce. And now we crown it with a top bun and whoa, look at those juices. <laughs> burger number two, fatty beef. Okay, as before I put some Gluten Morgan secret sauce on the bottom bun. Now I close it with the top bun and take a look at those juices. Incredible. Burger number three, mixed, lean and fatty. Again, secret sauce on the bottom bun. And we're done. Assembling sandwich. Wow, beautiful. There was not enough taste, not enough flavor because the lack of fat. The second one, it was a full fat cat, which has a really, really huge amount of fat. Okay. That's why you loved it, but it's so strong and so powerful because I think you can eat more than just half of this burger. <laughs> and the third one was the, the mixture between these two ones, which I think I prefer because it's not that heavy, no? Okay. Finally, we're in Belgium. Now to the library. I traveled to St. Vit, Belgium with my sourdough starter from Ushuaia to visit the famous sourdough library and meet Kade Smet, the librarian, and give it to him in hand. We need to rehydrate this sourdough starter. So we add some little water in there to start dissolving it and bringing or waking up all the microorganisms that are in there. I use a spoon, or well, the other side of the spoon. <laughs> Now we need to mill some flour. I'll use your stone mill and my grain from Patagonia. So now we add here the sourdough starter in the flour and we add some water. And with the spoon, we start mixing again, always by the eye, trying to get this texture, which is kind of... Applesauce. Applesauce, good, like a puree. Some more water. Mix in and what do you think? I like it. And I think we're done. What? Now it is. Okay, so shall we? Yes. Okay. Let's go and put it in the fridge of the library. Come on, you can put it there and we will keep it for as long as we can. Wow, wow, it's an honor. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations. Oh. Thank you. Guarantee that your sourdough will be kept safe here. So congratulations. Whoa. Hi. What Gl am I? Gluten, what are you doing in my kitchen? I was about to bake some gluten burger buns really? with this pumpkin, yeah. Maybe we should make some burgers. Yes, but first, let's make the dough. Let's, let's do, do this. this. The greens are flour, sugar, some salt, yeast, of course the pumpkin, and milk instead of water. Do you know where these bowls are from? Yes. Brazil. Brazil? Yeah. <laughs> they really are, actually, they're from Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> let's start. We mix everything. How you doing? Ooh, oh, yeah. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> now, so That's upsetting. The sugar. So yes. Very, very clean chef. Yes, a clean chef. Yeah. Yeah, clean chef. <laughs> One egg. One we eggs. want to open it? Yes, please. And then we add the milk. 
and we start mixing. So do you make your own burger buns? No. No. This is a first time. That's crazy. Why would I put burger buns? Yeah. We live in the USA. You can have everything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Yeah, but we not have... pumpkin buns. No, that's right. Uh, I've actually, to be honest, I've never heard of a pumpkin bun. So. Uh, not yet a gluten burger bun. There you go. Uh, more good milk. color. Yeah, good color, yeah. Natural. Just, you make this look so easy, gluten. Yeah, well, I'm gluten. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what's your favorite burger bun? Favorite burger oh, bun? Or how it should be? Mm, you don't want the answer. Mm. <laughs> I like a classic, no frills, mm -hmm. what I call a, I call it a white squishy bun. With it's, sesame? It's oh, without sesame. Mm. With no sesame. I don't no need sesame. sesame. Okay. That's overrated. <laughs> Butter goes in. Take a look at the dough. It's completely different. It's orange. Yeah? <laughs> First of all, for starters, it's the... This should be weighing around 80 grams. 80 grams, okay. Yeah. Giving some tension. The idea is that we have this crust should be like a, like a dome. Okay. Right? <laughs> and now we put here the balls. And do you want to make one ball? Sure. Okay, 80 grams, remember. 80 grams, you got it. Okay. I'm gonna make it, make it, I don't know what I'm doing, so. Mm. <laughs> It's like a meatball, yes, yeah, like a meatball. I think you're doing a meat, what was meatball. That, what were you doing with this huh? thing here? I don't, you know, you so have burgers, I burgers in your veins. I don't know. Oh, it's pretty close. Put it here. Okay. Oh. Put it here, and then you do it like this. Oh. <laughs> this is the gluten touch. Never the gluten touch. <laughs> and then we brush each one of the buns. Now we let them rise till they double in size. And then we bake them at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 minutes. Wow! Ooh, here are the buns. That's warm. Beautiful oven you have. Beautiful. Huh? Thank you. Yeah. That is oh, hot. It's very hot. hot. Ooh. It's hot. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. You're not Brazilian. A little bit, little bit. Oops. That's yeah, perfect right there. So it's a little small, lower on the bottom and taller on top. Tell me what you feel. Oh, wow. wow. Oh, wow. That smells really good, actually. <laughs> the best way to make a spreader. Hammer a spoon. About the, the meat that we're going to use for the patty. I it's use a secret. So 75% lean, 25% fat. Wow. Sounds good. Okay, good sound. Look That's a good sound. Good sound. Salt. That's the only thing that you add to That's the meat. It. That's it. So the next thing is thin sliced Vidalia onions. See how how you do that? I'm a mandolin. So around the world, it's white onion. Mm -hmm. uh, in the US, it's the, it's the sweet onion. It's a nice Vidalia, onion. yeah, from, from Georgia. So I could you use could, the red mm, onion now? No, no, never. 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 You have, you'd, Sweet onion has a lot of sugar in it, mm -hmm. and it's good. You need to caramelize the onions ah, quickly. Yeah. So also they cook quickly because they're so thin. See yeah, that? it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot, but it cooks down mm -hmm. to about half. Now next, very important, you have to have the right spatula. The spatula. Spatula. <laughs> wow, it smells, smells amazing. Amazing already, right? Yeah, yeah, it cooks fast, super yeah. fast. That's the onion. That's it. Now what I would do is put the our toasted bun back mm -hmm. on top. Look at that. The crown. Now I do that because I can have, I can control yeah. it. See that? Yeah. I can now control what I'm doing. The crown, right? And the moist goes into the bread too and make it like this. Take a look at this. Yeah. Wow. Nice trick. Just so it's all steaming together. See that? Mm -hmm. So you told me the, the pandemia. You were doing this. Pick it up. You pinch and pull. We're done. That's it. Wow. That's all. The pickles. Pickles, yes. Pickles. Ah. Pickles are important. Go ahead. Yes. Pickles, always pickles. Well, we're going to put them on the side. Oh, I'm sorry. This here again. Okay. On the side right there. Look at that. Perfect. Perfect. And it's really great. Actually, it's mustard is really good on this. Okay. So I will the mustard. What we'll do. On the bun? Yep. Perfect. There's plenty. Wow. That's pretty good. Another thing about Ooh. this. Mmm. Cheers. Thank you for the invitation. Mm. Mm. Oh, thank you for the bun. Oh. Mm. Uh -huh. mm. 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 The part is good. I like it. Well, so today I am going to show you the four secrets of baking that you didn't know that you had to know. But if you don't have a cast iron, don't worry. You can do the same with this baking bag. Yes, those bags that were originally designed for baking meat, chicken or fish are now also suitable for baking bread. The principle is the same. When the loaf is inside the bag, close it and put it in the oven for around 20 minutes. Time to check the oven bag. And there you can see it. The bread had an incredible oven spring too. Now remove the bag and take it back to the oven for around 20 minutes more. Until it browns completely. And here's the result. Have you heard about this method before? And if you don't have an oven bag either, we have a third option. 
the papillot. It's the same method generally used to cook fish. The only difference this time is that we're going to bake bread. It is very similar to the previous methods. The idea is to retain all the steam during the first half of the baking process. And there you can see how well it works. Now we simply take it back to the oven until golden brown. And this is the final result. Not bad at all. Am I right? If there's one thing a sourdough starter needs to activate, it's heat. And sometimes we are in a cold environment. The solution to do it is to use warm water. But remember that it shouldn't go past 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We do as usual. We add a couple of spoons of flour and then add the warm water. We are always doing it by the eye. And a few hours later, we are going to end up with a super active sourdough starter. Look at how many bubbles it has. It is ready to work. The opposite might happen as well, being in a very hot climate that makes it difficult for us to work with the dough. For that, I recommend lowering the temperature of the water using ice cubes. Yes, it's that simple. And here one more hack for hot weather. If you can't get the temperature right, what you can use is one of these camp refrigerators, in which we are going to add some ice and place a sourdough starter inside. This also applies to any other type of dough. This way, we'll be able to achieve the indicated temperature so that the dough ferments peacefully. Now, for those who feel like traveling with your sourdough starter, like I do, or just want to store it for longer, we're going to dehydrate it. We're going to take a tablespoon of active sourdough starter and we're going to coat it with plenty of flour. The idea is to dehydrate it with that amount of flour. As soon as we get a very dry dough that crumbles between our fingers, we will have it ready. Now we transfer it to a zipper bag and this way it will last for a long time. And now, to bring it back to life, what needs to be done is a reverse process. Transfer the sourdough starter into a bowl and simply add water. Mix, looking for a creamy texture as always, and in a short time we will have it back. And look how beautiful it looks. There it goes. Now let's take it one step further. We are going to completely dehydrate the sourdough starter. Yes, 100%. Take an active sourdough starter and place it on a parchment paper. Uh, it's, um, it's not that messy. Um, so we... It's like painting. Bricolage is not my thing. And now we leave it like this in the open air to let it dry. Several days later. And here we have it completely dry, as if it was an old dried paint. This is super relaxing. You should do this too. Now we transfer it to a jar. And this way, you can keep it for a thousand years. Okay, 9.99. Here comes the recycling portion of the video. We're going to use one of these milk or juice boxes to make our own banneton. Reminiscent of the DIY classes at school. Let's cut out one of the faces of the box. And then using one of the cups that we've already seen, we use it as a linen to cover it. Here we have a perfect banneton. When we want to ferment dough, I hope you have enjoyed this video. And if you want to learn more about sourdough bread and sourdough starter, I encourage you to check the link on the description. And remember, this masterclass was specially designed for you.